Okay, good morning. Um, we are just 15 minutes away from midday in the UK, and I think we've got a few people here in the room already, which is great. Welcome. I, I'm Simon Campbell. Um, I'm starting this early to check that uh, you can hear and see me okay. So if you are in the room, you could help me just in these next five or ten minutes before we start today's um, event, the Round the Clock Trader. And um, we've got Tom Hugar joining us first in just under 15 minutes. So um, what I'd like to ask you is if you, uh, this is a new platform, uh, sorry I should mention, uh, we're very used to using uh, GoToWebinar, I've made a switch, I'll explain why uh, later, but uh, hopefully this will improve our whole event experience. Um, but all the buttons are a little bit strange to me as they are to you, I guess, as well, so we're both uh, going to be learning uh, here at the same time. The most important thing that uh, we need to do is to make sure that we can hear and see each other. So at the moment, I believe you're just seeing my webcam. Uh, hello. Um, so it's me, and um, if there's anybody there that is uh, listening, use the chat box, um, which is down the right-hand side. You should already see some questions posted. I've been talking to Larry Pesavento, who's coming on later. We were just finalizing his start time. And I've posted the link there. So um, use that box. That everything you post in there is visible to everybody. So uh, it, it's one of the advantages that we have over the old system, where all the questions only came to me, and then I would repost uh, and so forth. So I thought this would save time. And I thought it would also be quite fun for us all to be able to see the the, the on-running chat, a bit like a WhatsApp group, um, so we can comment and, and ask questions in there. At the same time, so uh, anybody that's that's there listening, just just drop something in, just to say hi, yes, or okay, I see you. Anything like that at all um, would be good. We've definitely got a few people here, um, although we are ten minutes away from the start time. So this is a platform called Crowdcast. It uh, does have various advantages um, in terms of capacity sizes and a little bit more funky in terms of being able to share it out to social media uh, and things like that as well. So um, this is the first event that we have done with it, however, so uh, stick stick with it. But um, we'll be getting going in about 10 minutes' time. I'm going to try, first of all, to bring Tom Hugard in, and we'll see if we can um, just make sure that he is there. Tom, I'm now inviting you. Okay, I haven't had any uh, feedback yet, um, so let me just check that you can see me and you can hear me, the settings. We are live. Um, and I'm inviting Tom onto the screen.
Okay, we're getting a few more people here, which is great. I can see you uh, are live just under 10 minutes away. I've asked our first speaker, Tom Hogar, to join us. Um, I'm just waiting for this to um, confirm that he's in the room. Okay, it's coming in now. So thanks, everybody. If you can, use that uh, chat box. If you can, just to write anything at all, just to let me know that you can hear me uh, and see me. Um, as they were using a new platform today and it is uh, a little bit of a trial by fire not knowing exactly uh, how it appears at your end um, lots of some new controls most of it just very similar of course we're all experts after zoom after the lockdown year but um, I'm still conscious I don't want to make sure I'm not talking to myself so if you can just let me have a uh, a yes or a hello at all in that chat box, um, that would be tremendous. Okay, Tom Hogard. Hey, hey. Good to see you. How are you? I'm all right. I'm all right. I wish I could use my microphone. Uh, sounds okay to me. Sounds okay. Welcome. Good. Thank you. I have to ask you what's 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 behind you. <laughs> Do sharks complain about Mondays? No, they they're up early biting. Ah, this is a sort of an update on these uh, postage we used to get, isn't it? About the gazelle and the lion. <laughs> Whoever you are, whenever you wake up, you better be running. <laughs> yes, that's the one. So is that your motto to live by? Is that very much so? Yeah. Great. Right, you're coming through really good. The the sounds good. The picture quality is fantastic. You must have a very good quality HD camera. I do. I have a 4K uh, Logitech. Fantastic. I think I'm going to have to update my lights as well. So, Tom, this is great. We're in. We're live. As I say, it's a new platform. We're using this for the first time today, and it's. Um, just a few things that I'm <coughs> trying to make sure how we, how, we, how we go about it. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll just keep you here if that's okay. Yeah. And then we'll give it another five minutes for people to, to join live. I'm just keen to know that this chat box is working. And then we can, um, I'm going to say a few words. I've got a few slides um, that I want to share with people. And then we're going to come over to you and we'll get you to share your screen so you can work off your screen. So okay. Should be all good. So yes. stand by. Uh, thanks for joining. We'll see you in a few minutes. Okay. Right, I will share.
Okay, so it's not actually going live yet until until, until the actual start time. That must be. Mm. That's why I'm not being able to answer any questions. Let's see, can you actually join the. Thanks, so. this is good. Just like to yeah, yeah. So, okay. So okay. You know what Great, happens. thanks. Yeah. Tom? Yeah. It, uh, it seems that it doesn't actually go live for everybody else until the actual start time, which is 12. Okay. So that's why I'm not getting um, people. Normally you get people saying hi and things in the chat box, but I'm not doing that as yet because Ali's checked in and she's saying, no, it's just saying, you know, it's a countdown, three three minutes to go sort of thing. So that's interesting. There's okay. a few things I'm going to have to learn about the setup. So so we can talk freely um, in the next couple of minutes, which is good. So Larry's up as well. He was... He's been able to post in the chat box for some reason. Um, Say something the, nice. <laughs> <laughs> something nice. Boom, boom. The call to action button here, Tom. I said, get your Al Brooks price action course here. That just takes you to the TD365 homepage. So. At any time throughout the sessions today, that that button um, should be there along the bottom. So <coughs> That's when clever. We're talking, um, yeah, we can just refer to that. Say, that, you know, there's a green sort of turquoise button at the bottom of the screen. Just click there, and that'll take you straight through um, to to sign up, rather than having to put the the links in the chat box. But we can do that as well. So this is this is interesting. How was your training this morning? Did you get out with Lewis? Yeah. I woke up at 3.30 and Mika woke me up because you know, she oh. didn't want to sleep by herself. And I couldn't fall back asleep. So by 5.30, I think I was just going to get up and stretch. And then, and then we started running at 6. And we trained till <laughs> quarter past 7. Uh, yeah. So I was a... Uh, and Lewis got new training shoes and he was so fucking fast today it's like what the hell have you eaten man i could not <laughs> keep up with him he's like Pow! gone how, how old is he now 23 20? yeah 23 23 wow well that's a good guess i knew i knew it was the early 20s but yeah well there's a difference when you're in your early 20s isn't there yes 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 i'm not 23 <laughs> <laughs> Great. So we've got we've got you, Simon Massey, James Settley, Francis Hunt, and Larry. So sounds good. I think once we get to twelve, it's going to click on to be live for everybody. And how long do I have? I have thirty to forty-five minutes, right? Uh, yes. I've got yep. a few slides I'm going to work through, so it won't take me more than about five, six minutes, though. Yeah. Uh, and then, and then we can get going, uh, and then it'll be just over to you. Share your screen. Uh, up at the top there, if you bring your mouse a little bit up at the top, it should uh, give you a. You've got a. Some options. A range of commands. The one there that says share my screen. Share the event, embed. Uh... No, Simon, it doesn't say share the screen yet. It says share, but there's a different kinds of kind of share. No, it's not a share. No. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll figure out. Let's go and. Have a look at that in 10, 10 minutes. Uh, let me do my opening slides because I think everybody is now in the room. Okay. Which is, which is great. So I'll say good afternoon. Um, I think we are now live. This is Round the Clock Trader. I'm Simon. We've got Tom Hugard here, our first speaker. Um, if you can, let us know that you are hearing and seeing 
me. Um, use the chat box. Um, James says hello. So hi, James. Thanks for joining. Thanks for giving us the um, the message. We're using a new platform today, so you need to bear with us um, if you can. Um, hello, James. There we are. So Tom's working. Right. So we've got people in the room, and we are live. Great. Larry's all is good. Great. Thank you, Larry. So let's just uh, get started. First of all, so welcome to uh, today's event. We've got about four hours, and we've got five speakers. We're here to learn all about trading, and we've got some of the best training educators there are. Um, we're in the UK, we're in America, we're in Cyprus, uh, and I'm speaking to you from Spain. So we're international today, and it's good to have you here. I know there's all sorts of other things going on at the moment, um, but if you can uh, stay live with us. There we are, everybody's coming in. Patrick, Ash, good afternoon, great to see you here. Thanks for joining. Uh, it's a new platform, guys, and I uh, hope you can bear with me. And I might not be as slick as we normally are, but uh, hopefully it should be more fun for you because everybody can see the comments. Uh, I suppose we're a bit restricted on the old platform to me reposting comments. So I want to try and get the as much interaction going as we can. Anyway, let me get started. Uh, you'll see this is Round the Clock Trader. We're all familiar with that. I know a lot of you will be uh, familiar with Round the Clock Trader events, but uh, in case you're new and haven't been on this, this is a, a brand which I set up many years ago to help traders meet the right uh, type of educators and services and products uh, that you need to, to trade effectively and to make the right choices. Uh, so we do lots of these online events and uh, when lockdown came last year, nothing changed for us at all because we've been doing online webinars for years. Um, but uh, we're going on to capitalize on doing sort of multi-speaker events. I bring you lots of different flavors of trading, lots of different uh, speakers and uh, traders themselves that have different strategies. And from that, I we'll want you to sort of help build your own strategy and take from that uh, the best way to trade for you because it's always different from other people. You'll see we're sponsored by uh, TG365.com today, which is an excellent broker uh, that can help you particularly if you're looking for uh, some leverage and some good short-term uh, trading uh, support, uh, T365 will offer you all that. We've got some more information coming up about that. But first of all, let me tell you what you're going to be doing um, this afternoon. Um, first of all, there's a little bit about myself, Simon Campbell, founder of Rent, Rent Clock Trader, as I say, born and raised in Scotland. A uh, few years in banking, um, I've been working most of my career though in my own businesses running investment seminars and expos and so forth um, i'm an associate of the chartered institute of securities investment didn't really help me when it came to trading and investing uh, taught me a lot about the sort of regulation and uh, the compliance side uh, of the business it, it, that was something that i had to do for a company which uh, um, i worked for previously called vertivest they they're a, an fsa regulatory company or should i say fca regulatory company uh, as it's now known as um, so i did do all that uh, regulatory exams which is uh, quite um, laborious but uh, it did give me a good grounding in how the markets work uh, IX Media is the company that I set up in 2014, and under that we launched Round the Clock Trader, the London Investment Week website as well. And uh, this year I'm bringing back the IX Investor Show, which is going to be a live in-person event at uh, London Heathrow Marriott Hotel, 26th of November, <laughs> provided restrictions are lifted, of course, by then. Uh, just a quick note on that note of compliance. This presentation will be regarded as educational guidance uh, to help you understand the principles of portfolio management and stock selection. Nothing we write or say or any of the stocks we might look at should be mistaken for financial advice or solicitation to buy or sell any investment uh, at all. If you have any doubt, of course, always consult a professional financial advisor. Um, we do want to teach you to be your own fund managers, um, but we don't want to encourage people who are not ready to take that step uh, to do so. So um, we just want to make it very clear um, there are risks involved in trading CFD and leveraged products. Uh, so if you're in any doubt at all, consult a, a professional. Going, moving on to today. Um, 
our first speaker, as you can see, Tom Hogard already uh, in the room here. Um, Tom's going to be talking about an introduction to scenario analysis. Um, Tom, Tom will teach you a concept he invented called scenario analysis to guide you in trading stock indices. The concept is based on the time of the week. So we'll be getting a start started on that just a couple of minutes time. And following Tom, we welcome Simon Massey from Trade Room Plus. Um, Simon Massey is going to be focusing more on a scalping uh, methodology for trading, scalping short-term profits uh, from using scalping. So we'll look forward to that at 1 p.m. Oh, there we are. And following Simon, Francis Hunt. Um, great speaker, Francis Hunt, the market sniper, but also the crypto sniper. Um, very Two very popular YouTube channels um, Francis runs, uh, in addition to his own uh, trading rooms. He's joining me today again. I said, Francis, can you come back and tell us what's going on with, with Bitcoin? Of course, we've had uh, quite a winter um, with Bitcoin shooting up. But you know they talk about the crypto winter coming. You know the price has fallen again. What's going on? What about the other coins as well? What about the other cryptocurrencies? Uh, where are we at? So, 145 for Francis. Following Francis, uh, technical levels in the global markets. Jamie Settley from Trade Desk, SB Trade Desk dot com, uh, formerly I believe Chief Market Strategist at Forex dot com. Jamie's a fabulous uh, speaker. He'll be giving us a, a, a round trip of all the charts um, there about 2.25 p.m. So breakfast time for him joining us from St. Louis in Missouri. And uh, finally at uh, 3 o'clock, 3.15, Larry Esavinto, of course. Larry's already here with us. It's very early. Good morning, Larry. Thanks for joining us. I'm sorry I got you off early. We had a mix up with uh, the time zones, but Larry's uh, a legend in the world of trading, uh, as you'll know. Uh, many, many, many best-selling books uh, to his name. Uh, he broadcasts every day at tfnn.com, uh, the trading show, uh, and has just been a great supporter to Round the Clock Trader over the years as well. So I'm very grateful for that. I'm very grateful for him coming today, um, specifically to talk about the ABCD pattern uh, and how you can simply use that to identify a dominant trend in the market. So uh, that's going to be great, worth waiting for alone. Let me tell you a little bit about TD365, our sponsors for today. Um, as we can see, tight fixed spreads, no commissions, fixed spreads. Our books course when you sign up. Let me tell you a bit about that in a second. Um, but that fourth bullet point there, 200 to 1 leverage, this is something that uh, will be exciting to anybody um, who is competent uh, in their trading and wants to uh, increase the amount of leverage. Uh, there are risks, of course, in, in that, so you need to know what you're doing. But uh, when you're there and you've had the right training, um, this can be a broker that can be a great partner for you to achieve uh, the right results. No commission fees. There's a, a list of the spreads currently on offer on the indices, um, which are quite good. So lowering your trading costs is the, the mission for t365.com. Um, the fixed spreads are fixed for the entire trading day. Uh, the great leverage is up to 201, uh, which is not available in many other brokers, of course. Uh, a negative balance protection, uh, so you can protect yourself. Your account will never go into uh, negative. We'll maybe ask Tom a bit about that when we get started. Um, single currency trading, so you can trade everything in your base currency, which prevents you uh, having another layer of risk, which is, of course, the exchange rate uh, on these fees. Uh, the, the funds are secured with Barclays Bank in London, which is obviously good to know, and um, TD365 is a regulated broker um, as well. So all these things that uh, you should be aware of and looking for when choosing a broker to sign up. Uh, now, today we've got a special offer with TD365. They have agreed to offer uh, an all Brooks price action trading course. Normally, this this is uh, definitely hundreds, if not thousands, of dollars. Al Brooks, of course, uh, you only need to tap them into Google, and you'll see thousands of pages of information about the legendary um, technical trader. 
Um, and this is the price action course, which can give you a lot of great uh, guidance on how to become a profitable trader. So I think there's two courses there, beginner course, 27 units, and the advanced course. Uh, all we're doing is, is asking people to open an account with GD365. It's free to do. Uh, there, there are terms and conditions. You can see all that on the website. And to go ahead and to access that course, you can do that by clicking on the, the, so the green button that's at the bottom of your screen now, where it says get your free Outbooks price action course. So thank you to uh, T365 for supporting us today. Um, that's it for my session. I'll be here uh, throughout the next few hours uh, moderating questions and uh, trying our best to manage uh, this live event. So let's go across to our first speaker now, um, Tom Hogard. Let me um, figure out, Tom, how we share your screen and uh, make sure that uh, we can start to, to see your slides. So I am going to... Hey, Simon, why do I have to yeah. sit with a head, why do I have to sit with a headset on? <laughs> I have a a trusty Ooh. one of oh, these. Look at you, so fancy. It, it's been very good to me over the years. Um, yeah. And low to, to 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 send it to the bin. Yet, let right. me get. Um, well, I have a, a I have a, a microphone as well, but it's just then. You know, I got one of these. I just don't know then how to. Uh, hear what you're saying so that's why i'm sat with these bad boys on but anyway okay. sorry. i'm going to get you onto the so we can okay what did you do now <laughs> All right. okay i am is that part of the plan no <laughs> <laughs> i have to be honest it's not let me um i'm gonna type a we comment here we are looking for um i'm looking for the the, the button to, to invite you to the main screen hmm. now tom when i Click on. Oh, hang on! I got some options here. Uh, toggle microphone, toggle video, high definition, share screen. It says. Ah, that's the version we're looking for. Yeah. Right. So I have to do this myself. It. it I'm not waiting for an invitation. Go figure. No. Okay. I've sent an invitation already. I think that's why it's in the. In the, I the, see. the menu. So if you okay. click on that. Right. So let's see what exactly am I sharing. <laughs> One sec. And uh, no, that. I'm just going to cancel this, Simon, because I'm trying to run the PowerPoint presentation. I think I'm going to have to do it kind of manually. So let's try that again. OK. I'm not sure how I would entire screen, window. All right, let's try this. <clears throat> OK, something's happening. Okay, I think we can see your your screen now, which is great. Okay, I'm now looking at your scenario analysis, Trader Tom, um, slide. It's okay. not in presentation mode. Does everybody else see the same? Is everybody else seeing Tom's slides? If you could just let us know. Let us know with the chat box. What happens if I actually click on... 
Okay, James, thanks. Okay, yep, we're good. We're good. Yes, okay, so everybody can see and everybody can hear. Fantastic. Okay, scenario analysis. Tom, okay, I'll leave it to you. I think we're all good to go. Yeah, I think I've figured this one out myself. Yeah, good to go. Right, okay, well, let, uh, let me just uh, try something here because that means I'm probably going to go over here. So if everyone could just bear with me for a sec, and then I will see if I can get this to work. Oh, look at that. Wow. Okay, no flies on me. Hello, everyone, and, and welcome to uh, Round the Clock Trader. My name is Tom Hugard. Uh, I have been on this Round the Clock Trader a uh, few times in my trading career, uh, usually always talking about something uh, different. I remember talking about Fibonacci analysis, I've been talking about trading psychology. Uh, and in today's presentation, I'd like to discuss something with you, which has been a part of my preparation for the trading day. Now, what I, I, I want to do a full disclaimer first. And that disclaimer is that this is a, 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 a very, very, Simon, when I hold up my hands, can people actually see me or can you just see the screen? My, my, we can see you as well. We can see oh, you on the slide. Okay, cool. Because otherwise, I, would, I don't want to be animated. Otherwise, I'll just sit here patiently and, and quietly. Uh, but it's good you can see me. Um, what I want you to be mindful of is that what I'm about to talk about scenario analysis is something that I could entertain you with for eight hours a day for five days a, a week. It's, it's, a, it's an enormous... Um, <clears throat> it's, it's an, an enormous... Uh, field to cover and it and let me give you an idea of um, how for example someone who was programming an algorithm would address uh, scenarios they may say well what's the likelihood that gold is going to rally between three o'clock in the afternoon and 3 30 um, does Dow Jones um, <clears throat> performance have any variance on the input to gold? Uh, is it correlated with dollar yen? Um, now, unfortunately, I don't have that capacity to program. And being predominantly a stock index trader, my focus is, has, has taken a, a slightly different turn and is taking in the turn of um, uh, <clears throat> trying to create a scenarios for every single day of the week that could guide me um, to profitable decisions. Um, so let me give you an example, one that didn't go very well. Uh, ahead of the FOMC meeting yesterday, uh, I had gone through every single FOMC announcement back to 2010, and there's roughly three a year. And so I have a data package and um, that will then tell me um, what happens in the moments before the announcement, what happens after the announcement, what happens during the press conference, and what can I expect? And, you know, sitting here the day after, you know how everyone is always the perfect hindsight trader. One of uh, the, the scenario I was playing at yesterday was that we were going to see a decline in the market. If we were going to see a decline in the market, the market would recover uh, very strongly at some point. And I went long the Dow Jones index. And um, it may sound like a lot to you, but I was stopped out by 25 points before the Dow then rallied about 250 points. And it's like this, um, and, and, and it's not to cry a, a river or play a violin. It's just, well, that's part and parcel of being a trader that the best laid plans at times don't always come to fruition. But what I want you to take away from this is that I had a game plan that was based on the behavior over the past 10 years worth of, of FOMC. So what I'm about to expose to you now is what I call scenario analysis, slightly more elaborate than what we witnessed yesterday, is the same kind of thinking that you are dreaming up questions. And those questions could be very, very different in nature. But one of the main drivers behind this argument, and now you should see a different slide. Can you, Simon, can you now see slide number two on, on the PowerPoint? 
sorry, just to make sure that it is working. Okay, I think. Then maybe someone can confirm that you can see slide number two. Brilliant. So slide number two shows you the closing prices of the Dow Jones index for the last 30 years. What you're essentially seeing is every single close for the last 30 years in the Dow Jones index, spanning all the way from uh, actually late 1989, all the way up to about present time. But what's interesting here is that even though that the Dow Jones about 30 years ago was trading around 2000 and today it's around 34,000, nevertheless, the distribution of days where the Dow Jones index closed up on the day versus the days where it closed down on the day is about 50-50. It's 49.6 to 50.4. And hang on, I just need to close the window one second. <laughs> I forgot about that. It's, we're in the middle of the summer and it's very warm here. It's in the 30s. And so sitting here is uh, it's a warm one. So it means that whenever I come to work, I basically have to be mindful of it. No matter how strong the trend is up or down, anything can happen at any point in time. So using this data, I began to create scenarios and a scenario is a reflection uh, on the idea that each trading day has a life of its own, but it also contributes to the bigger picture. So um, what I want uh, to address here are certain patterns that happen during a trading week. Um, so let me, um, uh, let me move on. Actually, I realized that uh, I just did a little bit of promotion here for myself. I don't sell any products, I, I have to I admit, but I do trade live every single day uh, on YouTube and I have a Telegram channel where I share my trades. So if you are interested in that, then go to tradertom.com and uh, there's plenty of, of resources that you can, uh, you can download free of charge and you're more than welcome to be part of the live trading room. <clears throat> so let's get on with some of the questions that I have asked myself. How often does the Dow gap up or gap down in a year? When it does gap up, how frequently is the or down? How frequently is the gap filled? And how often is the gap filled within the next 72 hours? How often is Monday the low and Friday the high? Does Fibonacci help you as a day trader? Is there any merit to the the uh, the saying that if you have a strong Friday, you'll have a strong Monday. How many days of a year does the Dow trade trend from uh, the early get go? And by a trend day, I mean how often does it start at one end of the chart and then it just moves up the whole day, or vice versa? Something that Larry Pesavento describes in his book, The Opening Price Principle, where you essentially you box the first say five or ten minutes of trading and then put a bracket around it. And if the market begins to trade above it, uh, the, the odds are high that you're going to get a trend day. Um, so some of those are some of the questions that I have asked myself, but I don't have time to go through every single one of the scenarios, because as I said, it would be here for about 40, 50 odd hours. So what I want to do is I want to give you some examples of how scenario analysis works. And I've deliberately selected some examples that perhaps are uh, will come as a surprise to you, come as a positive surprise to you, because I think that that would perhaps um, give you a guidance to your own trading. So the first scenario I've wanted to uh, discuss with you is basically just a question which in itself isn't overly interesting. That is, how often is Monday the high or the low of the week for the Dow Jones index. And all the data and all the research and statistics that I have collated over the years are based around the Dow Jones index. 
as well as the Nasdaq and the S&P 500, but also the DAX and the FTSE. So if we're going to answer that question, it isn't very often that Monday marks the higher the week or the lower the week. But in a moment after we've gone through this initial research, I'll show you a, a much more important and a, a much more interesting pattern. But for now, I'll just state that over the last year, Monday has marked the higher the week or the lower the week about 31 times, which is about 60%. But as I said, a 60% isn't that much better than just a, a, a coin flip. It's, it's still even a 60%, it's, 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 almost, it's almost random. So I don't consider that particularly helpful, but say that you prepare for trading on a Thursday, and today being Thursday, and you see that Monday so far is the highest day of the week. Could that help you? So these are some of the questions that I, as a researcher, and then bringing that into my own trading will operate. I'll ask questions and then attempt to answer them. So when I do my research, I test it manually. And I it, it, it basically works like this, that I... I print out years and years of intraday data, and I go through them manually. And I have written on them Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And the reason why I'm doing that is because I don't just want a printout of an A4 sheet that says, this is what happens so and so often, because I need to also be mindful of the small nuances in trading, because it's often the small nuances that will make the, that will have the biggest impact on our trading. My own trading mentor, Larry Pesavento, once said that you only see on a chart what you've trained your eyes to see. And that resonated well with me, which is why I do the grunt work rather than just asking a programmer to you know, test a, a hypothesis and then spit out the result. So, uh, so what I have asked myself here is, if Monday so far is the highest traded point for the last three days, i.e. Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, then how often is Thursday going to trade below the low of Wednesday? So let me just try and rephrase that. Imagine that you're preparing for trading in the Dow Jones index or the American index, uh, American stock indices on a Thursday morning. And you see that the higher the week so far is Monday. How often can you expect continuation of that weakness that has been seen during Tuesday and Wednesday on the Thursday. So I found that there was a total of 25 times in the last year where I was faced with this possibility, i.e. that Monday was so far the highest point of the week and Tuesday and Wednesday were incapable of getting above the high set on the Monday. Now, it could be that Wednesday was higher than Tuesday, but still lower than Monday. Or Wednesday could be lower than Tuesday, which was again lower than Monday. But out of those 25 times, how often uh, would I then see prices on the Thursday trade below the low that was set on the Wednesday? And out of those 25 times, I discovered that 21 out of those 25 times resulted in the Dow Jones trading below the low of a Wednesday. So to me, that is tremendously uh, a significant piece of statistics because 21 out of 25 is 84%. And so once you begin to get up in the 80s in terms of probability, you're beginning to say, well, that's something that is tangible. It may not... It may not necessarily mean that on a Thursday morning you just bang go short the market, but but it may mean that if if you are seeing a pattern that you want to trade on the short side, you can do so with a far greater conviction. It also opens up the possibility that if the Wednesday low has not been surpassed, that you instinctively at least have a target in mind. And once you achieve those that target, you may want to put your stop loss further down and try and protect your profit or and so forth. So that is one aspect of scenario analysis. So let me try and give you some examples of what is meant by this in this context. So what you're seeing here is trading on a Monday, separated by a line here. And then you got Tuesday. Now notice that Tuesday was not able to get above the highs set on the Monday. And then on the Wednesday, we are trading uh, lower again, 
incapable of trading above the highs on a Monday. And then comes Thursday. And although we rallied strongly on the Wednesday evening, the Dow Jones fell very strongly the day after. Let's take another example. Here's another example. Here's Monday. Notice how Tuesday and Wednesday is lower than this high set on Monday. And this is a five minute chart in the Dow Jones index. And then we come over to Thursday and Thursday gaps up, sells into a double top and then makes a new low below the Wednesday low. Let's take another example. And don't worry, I haven't taken all 25 examples uh, with me. Not at all. Um, here it seems as if I have uh, not even put the 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 the, uh, the, uh, the day of the week on. I apologize for that. That's an oversight on my part. Here's Monday. It's Tuesday and Wednesday is lower, and then Thursday. But I guess what's interesting here is that Thursday actually gaps below the low of Wednesday. So you have to be mindful of that, whether you actually want to short the market down here, even though it has already fulfilled the criteria that you set about. Okay. All right. Another example here, Monday is the high, Tuesday and Wednesday are lower, and then Thursday gap down. But I think this is an interesting example because on, on, on this Thursday, the market actually begins to trade higher virtually immediately. The first three bars, which is five minutes each, sets the tone. Many traders use a 15 minute bar chart as their bracket for a breakout. And then you get in motion a trend day with a very deep retracement, admittedly. But once the high of the first push higher is exceeded, the market doesn't look back. Uh, another example, Monday is the high, Tuesday and Wednesday are lower highs. And then Thursday, take a look at this because technically this fails. I know that it's very marginally, but nevertheless, this is a failure pattern, one where the, the weakness did not materialize. Okay, so let's go through another scenario. Say that you are preparing for trading on a Monday morning and you notice that in the previous week, the high set on Thursday was not exceeded during trading on a Friday. Armed with this knowledge, what can you derive from the Monday? What can you expect from the Monday when the high for the last two trading days was Thursday as opposed to Friday. So it's very important here that we're not talking about the trading that happens in the 24 hour cycle. We're talking about the trading that takes place in the regular trading hours. So if you are in, in the UK, for example, that's going to be from 2.30 in the afternoon till 9, p, 9 p.m. at night. And if you are on the continent and on the European continent, it's going to be uh, 3.30 in the afternoon till 10 o'clock at night. So it's very important that you only measure that. And that in itself can present a, an issue because many brokers will show you around the clock charts. And at times it's very hard to differentiate between, well, what, uh, what part of this chart is actually in the very active trading session during the US trading hours and what part of it is in the middle of the night. So you need to be mindful of that. So we want to ask ourselves, what does the Monday look like if the high on Thursday was not exceeded during the Friday's trading session? So, so the over the last two weeks, sorry, after the last over the last 52 weeks, there were 21 instances where the price action on a Friday was unable to trade above the highest point of the previous day, Thursday. So what I did, as just explained. Uh, is, uh, sorry, I just got distracted here because I can see the comments as well and Wayne just posted something. So all of a sudden you, uh, you're sort of taking a little bit out of the flow, Simon, just so you, just so you know. 
Um, I essentially wanted to create some scenarios that enabled me to trade on a, trade the Mondays with a higher degree of confidence because I see that Mondays are kind of this the, the cycle resets. People have had time over the weekend to digest either the strength of the market or in the week or the weakness in the market. So over the last uh, 52 weeks when I did this research, there were 21 instances where, where I came to work on a Monday morning and I could observe that the Friday's high was lower than the Thursday's high. So what did that mean? Well, let's take a couple of examples. Here's Thursday and here's Friday. So sure, we, we can argue that the trend is down, what I'm saying here is that my research tells me that the odds are very high with this kind of pattern that you're going to see the low of the Friday being surpassed. And this is the example from uh, uh, last week, sorry, this week. Let's take another example. Here's Thursday, Friday. I brought this along because I think it was a really beautiful pattern. Also because it's actually quite marginal how it fulfills the criteria. So I brought this pattern along because I wanted you at least to be mindful of that. The moment the low has either been touched or slightly touched or exceeded, then the pattern in itself has been fulfilled. The criteria has been fulfilled. Let's take another couple of examples. Uh, Thursday is significantly higher than Friday. And on the Monday morning, the market has made a big gap down. But of course, we can also use this information. Uh, Patrick, it could be due to many things, but I'm not, I'm not looking for uh, a reason why something happens. It, I'm just looking for the raw statistics. There could always, always be profit taking. Of course there is, but you, know, you have to understand that it's institutions that trade against each other. It's not people like you and I that affect a chart particularly. It's big institutions buying and selling, demanding and supplying. But what I find is interesting here is that this pattern, while impressive that it does open lower, actually sets up a trend day in the opposite direction. So while the criteria has been fulfilled, it doesn't actually mean that I have a sell short signal here because the gap is so significant. Another example here is identical to it, is that the, the Thursday is significantly higher high than the Friday, and then we gap down on a Monday. And I was always under the illusion that Monday tended to be the day that was positive if you had a really bad Friday. And the research uncovered that that was most certainly not always the case. Let's give another example here. Uh, Thursday, Friday, and then Monday. I brought this example along because it doesn't work very well, but it comes with kind of a warning that is if Monday is a bank holiday in the US, it could be the 4th of July, it could be Labor Day, it could be Memorial Day. I'm always very careful how I, uh, I position myself. In. And as you can see on this chart here, this is the hallmark of a holiday. There's very little going on. Let's take this one here. Here's Thursday and Friday. Friday actually closes very strong, but on Monday we gap down. But I count this pattern here as a failure pattern because it failed to go below the low that was set on the Friday. So while the market did gap down and show weakness, as one could have hoped if we used this pattern to be short the market, it didn't actually fulfill the criteria of going below the low of the Friday. So nevertheless, when I did this piece of research, 20 times out of 21, the Dow actually did trade lower on a Monday. And then to me, that's a very, very high odd. However, having said that, in the last six months, though, this setup has failed three times. So I don't want you to uh, I don't want you to take this as uh, as, a, as as the holy grail, the gospel, because like anything, we always have to manage several things when we're trading. One is our emotion, and the other one is our how much we want to risk 
in the market. But nevertheless, it's not so often that you see a pattern actually materializing 20 out of 21. Um, so to me, that's an example of scenario analysis, something that I'm incredibly mindful of. Okay, that, that uh, uh, rounds up what I wanted to say from this very short introduction to uh, scenario analysis. If you have any questions, you're more than welcome to ask me now. You're also welcome to uh, contact me on hello at tradertom.com. You're welcome to go to my website, uh, tradertom.com, where you will find an enormous amount of free uh, resources. Uh, I've been a trader for a couple of decades and I've collected a lot of material over the last two decades. Um, some of them are from sources that you will no longer find like bulletin boards with some great traders. Um, anyway, go in there, have a, uh, a surf around for yourself. That's uh, all I have to say for now, Simon. So let's see if I then, do I then close the video or no? What do I do? Tom, I'm just uh, coming back in and yep. putting on my own video, which is there. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, now we've got some questions. So we could just leave your screen there or, or just probably look at sure. the questions. Now, James says, I was thinking Monday would go higher than on Friday. Yeah, it's not wrong? really a question. It's more like a statement or an opinion. Yeah. That's great. What does everybody think about this? I mean, this is a, a, a new, I, I don't think anybody's actually given a presentation like this, Tom. Um, on this Doubt it very much. I, I'm strategy. quite certain I'm the first one to ever discuss this. It doesn't, Copyright, seem, NF, NF. Uh, doesn't seem to get the excitement of your audience today, Simon. That's but is okay. It, is it, uh, I mean, how long have you tested this? Is it one, I mean, none of the, you've traded it, but how long have you been testing it, would you say? I started doing this uh, about three years ago. Uh, for example, I made a call just only uh, early on this week on YouTube. I'm saying, actually, this is Monday. Uh, and when I trade on, on YouTube, I trade live with real money. And I said, you know, this is actually a, uh, um, a Monday where the Friday was lower than Thursday. So whilst we're up here, I believe I sold into a double top. It could have been a, a lower low that I, I, I sold on a 15 minute chart. But essentially in front of people's eyes, I made close to about 70, 80 points. And I think I was trading at a couple of hundred dollars a point. So it's still, you know, it's, it's still a good $15,000 trade. But what I was pleased about was not the money, but being able to demonstrate this in front of a, uh, of a, of a live audience, because it, it's not something that people generally talk about. And I'm not 100% sure why it works either. Um, but, but again, as some, I think it was Patrick that suggested it could be due to profit taking. Well, that could be said for anything. It could be due to window shopping. It could do due to profit taking. Uh, whatever the reason doesn't actually, reasons don't make us money. We need to get in and actually put our skin in the game in order to make money. And having scenario analysis um, as part of my repertoire enables me to go in on a Monday, on a Wednesday, or a Thursday, or Tuesday, and I'm not 100% blind to what could happen. I have an idea of how I want to play the day. You mentioned the YouTube channel. Is that is that recorded and up there? If you wanted to go back and have a look at that, what what's the channel? What do we search for? The, the channel is tradertom.com, and and every single every single session that I do is recorded. So this would be the, I, tr I, I trade live twice a day, and this one would be the uh, the one from Monday, the PM session where I trade the US Open for about an hour and a half. Fantastic. Couple of questions there. Yeah, um, I saw that. It was a good one from uh, Alex. He said, do you factor in other things like the end of the month? Well, I think Alex is on to a great question because statistics will dictate that there's it's, it's far more likely to see an extended move in the final two days 
of the month or in the final first two days of the month. And many reasons have been given for that. It could be portfolio rotation among institutions. It could be 401k money coming in, as in pension fund contributions. Um, so, so someone once drew me a, uh, a, a, a cycle work based on how the market tends to trade over a month. And you could see that it during the the first handful of days in a month and then latter handful of days in a month, the market was far more likely to be biased positive than negative, whilst the middle the middle bit of the month was far more likely to be weaker than stronger. So th those are just perspectives. Um, so, but to, an to answer Alex's question specifically dead on, no, I don't factor that in. So I'm not, I'm not mindful of that if Friday is the last day of the quarter or the last day of the month, then how will I have to address that on Monday? If Friday is lower than Thursday, I will still tackle that head on as if I would do any other scenario analysis. All right. Yeah, repositioning, especially at the end of the quarter. Yes, that was what I was thinking, says um, Alex. Yeah, this is great. Everybody can see these questions now. Um, previously, our old system, <clears throat> the questions were only sort of coming to me, and so I had to sort of share them and uh, verbalize them. So uh, I'm quite enjoying this. I'm quite enjoying the fact that we can all just see each other's questions and things. Uh, it's a little bit Where easier. do you see how many people are logged in today, Simon? We've got it down at down the, the bottom. Um, is it just me that sees that? Possibly. We've We've got we've got at the moment I think we've got about fifty four in the room. Now, if you were in the other room, I'm sorry, Wayne. Uh, I know you find your way into the other live trading room. Now, this was a uh, something that I set up. We're not actually using it for this particular event, uh, but it's something that the software allows us to do is to have live trading going on. In, in the background, uh, while we've got these presentations going on. So it was something that I was experimenting with. Uh, we're not using it uh, as yet today. And I, uh, I'm sorry that you find your way in there and nothing was happening. Uh, but like sitting on your own in the conference room um, it, when the schedule's changed. Uh, so anyway, we are we, we seem to have got through fine. Tom, you've, you've, you've unshared your screen now, which is, which is great. Do we have more questions for Tom before we lead into our next speaker. We've got Simon Massey coming in to join us. Um, anything else that we can um, ask can, Tom before we Can I sit in on this session as well? Uh, or do I have to? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. What, what we'll do is we'll take, take your, take your, untoggle your, your microphone and your video. Yeah. And then you can just sit in for the, the rest of it. Yeah, it'd be good to have you. Uh, do I do that, Simon? You. Just sorry, everyone, but this is the first time we are using this software. So we just want to make sure that we are not making a complete cock of it. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, here we go. So I'm, I'm now going to put it back to my screen. There we go. I think... Okay, so now um, you should be seeing the the slide on my screen now with uh, the details of Simon Massey's picture there um, of the round the clock trader logo. Is that what everybody else sees? Just to keep me in the picture. Um, great. So I'm going to bring our next speaker, Simon Massey, in. So anyway, listen, good afternoon again. We've just heard Tom Hogarth. This is all recorded, and uh, we are struggling a little bit with uh, a new platform for the webinar, so bear with us um, as that. But good to have you here. Uh, round the Clock Trader, we've got five speakers. We're live four hours this afternoon, and um, we've just heard the great Tom Hogarth talking about scenario analysis. Um, we're sponsored by td365.com today. Um, we'll tell you a bit more about them later, but the, the button that you should see at the bottom, it says, get your free Al Brooks price action trading course. That's a special gift for you today uh, for anybody that opens up uh, an account, a free account with, with uh, TD365. Go in there and you'll get access to, to I think it's several hours of the, the, the online course. 
Albrook's um, legendary uh, technical trader, of course, uh, very well published uh, on online. Uh, let me bring our next speaker there in. Uh, Davin, hi, I can see you there as well. Good to see you, Carwin. Great, Stephen. Good to see uh, so many of you here. Thanks for following me onto the the, the new platform. And um, just before I say it's all working fine, <laughs> he says, um, I am looking for uh, Simon Massey. Uh, oh, there's another page here. Some things are, are, are a little bit better, some things are, are, are not so much uh, better. I can already start to see some uh, things, but it's, uh, it's like jumping into a higher car. You just have to familiarize yourself with the, all the new controls um, that go along with that. It's essentially just the same. Great. Okay, Simon Massey is here, and I'm going to invite him onto uh, the main stage, as it, as it says. Um, when we can see Simon Massey, we'll be able to unmute his microphone. So here it is very sunny back in the UK uh, today. I don't know if you know, but I'm speaking to you from Spain today, um, where it is uh, raining. You'll be happy to hear. <laughs> We're very happy to hear that, actually, because it's been uh, quite hot and dry the last few weeks. Um, but uh, if it is sunny in the UK, I'm especially grateful to you for joining us because uh, it's always good to, to get outside and take advantage of the good weather. So thank you for coming in and spending the time uh, with us this afternoon. Right, we should... Uh, uh, right, okay, don't worry, Simon. I'm good to invite uh, again that invite. Let's see if... Hello. There oh, we go. I can see something happening I now, which means um, I can see that Trade Room Plus logo. Great. Simon Massey is uh, the lead trader at Trade Room Plus. Can and you hear me, Simon? Is. Great. I can see you uh, with the the green screen in the yeah. The background. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I usually put a beach or a Lamborghini behind me or something, but this I don't appear to have figured it out. So you're just gonna have to look at my green screen, unfortunately. Greenski's is very good. You're coming. It outlines you very well. How are you? It's nice to see you. Thanks for joining. I'm good. I'm, I'm slightly worried about messing up this new software, though, but I guess we'll see. Well, it, so am I as well. So we're, we're sort of learning on the job. Um, <laughs> now, what we can do is to ask you to hover your 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 mouse sort of across your, your own picture where you see your own uh, video cam and... At the top of that, you will see a toggle for sharing your screen, hopefully. Boom. I think it should be done, if that's correct. I think it's happening. I think it's happening. Love it. I'm Simple. Going, I'm going to press stop sharing my screen. So that reduces one of the screens that's being shared. No one wants to see a big picture of me. Uh, and it's frightening, isn't it? These HD cameras, they pick up... I know, I know. I've got a proper DSLR as well. It's very vivid the, to me. I need one of yours from 1993. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I can see scalping for about an hour, uh, which uh, suggests that this is about going in, scalping a few scalps, uh, in the, uh, and, and getting back out again. I, I guess this is uh, a style of trading that, that uh, I know you do, and... Uh, you're part of a team that run Trade Room Plus, and um, we've known each other just just over a year. In fact, um, we've we've never met in person, but uh, we've done plenty of these uh, Zoom calls together, which is great. So, uh, I can see the the slide. I wonder how we can make it the main um, slide. Does everybody have the the main slide up, or is it just my um, settings, perhaps? Because we are looking at the three of us. I'd like to make it. The main, the main slide. There we go. Fantastic. Great. I I so, I Simon, I'll, I'll pass over to you. Um, as I say, traderoomplus.com. It's a trading room. Um, I'm sure we'll, 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 we can talk about it later. You, uh, like Tom, uh, previously have built up a 
very big following on YouTube, which is fantastic. You're in there um, every day, uh, sort of doing what you preach uh, in front of people in the live market. So there's no uh, magic or, or trickery involved. I know you like to keep it quite simple, and you are not a fan of layering tons of indicators and signals onto charts uh, and looking for things that may not exist. I, I think it's quite a, a, a sort of a, a no-nonsense approach to trading, which I think is uh, what we're we're all looking for here. Um, so let me hand over to you, uh, and uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you got started at trading uh, into trading. Some people here will have seen you on previous events, but there's some uh, new names here for, for the first time. So I'll hand over to you and uh, let us get started. Okay, thank you very much. I think everyone can hear me okay on this microphone. If I need to speak louder, do let me know. It's about as loud as I can put it in my end. Um, yeah, so um, I've generally sort of fallen into the pattern of scalping. I've always sort of revisited that um, throughout. I've been trading for about 10 years now. And I've always revisited um, coming back to... Uh, Going back to looking at really short-term time frames, it suits my trading personality and things like that. So I sort of base my trading sessions, base my trading sessions around that. I want to talk about scalping for about an hour. Um, it's not in reference to how long this presentation it is. It's mainly in reference to how long I actually spend doing it a day. And it's not the old. Don't want to get fallen into the trap of the old, you know, five minutes a day sitting on a beach type thing. It's not about that. It's probably how much mental capacity I've got for the actual market. So. Um, what I'm going to do today is have a few PowerPoint slides, and then what I tend to do is I tend to record all of my trades, um, or, or a lot of my trades, either on YouTube. So we're, we're going to go through a load of actual recorded trades and talk about the setups and, and stuff like that you can see here, um, that we're going to go into detail about those. And we're going to give, talk about the sort of psychological context of those trades at any one time, because of course... One of the big issues with trading is how we go from complete uncertainty to certainty. You know, you, you've got no idea what's going to happen next, but as time goes on, you do. And because the feedback is so unambiguous, you know, it, it draws us into hindsight. The classic trading education is, look here, you could have gone short here, could have gone long here. And it's like, well, brilliant. How do you actually make decisions at the time? What does the price action look like? The classic moving average cross never looks the same when it's actually happening in, in most circumstances. So it's just a case of, one of the reasons I do record my trades and do trade live is because it's about the decision point. There's only two things we can do in trading. It's get in a trade and get out of a trade. It's beautifully simple, but horrendously hard at the same time. And the only time we can make decisions is at the time during uncertainty, which has some pretty profound psychological implications. So um, so what I would say to you, do you think trading stressful enough to you? So do I am monitoring the chat as well. So please do interact and, and let me know what you think. I would say bit of a humorous note is trading stressful enough for you at the moment you know do you find trading stressful enough is that a yes or a no you know for those of you who are active traders and have got past probably the honeymoon stage do you find it stressful enough and what i would say is if the answer is no <laughs> yeah absolutely then why don't you try some scalping and then it can be even more stressful for you so <laughs> it's the shorter term time frames are sort of more stress you tend to get with trading but at the same time in my view, I think it gives you, you don't, right, well, we'll get on some scalping then, Raj. I think what, what tends to happen is people start from these really short-term timeframes and then move out to longer-term timeframes. So I think the advantage of short-term timeframes is because it's a thinner tightrope, there's finer margins of error, you have to make decisions. If you're doing a daily swing trade and you're not particularly feeling in the zone or you're, not, you know, you're feeling a bit stressed or annoyed or angry, you might not necessarily need to make the right decision there and then because the market relative to your stock loss and your leverage may not be moving that far whereas if you're on a day if you're on a five minute time frame and you're not in the right zone to trade and you don't take that loss and you're probably more leveraged up because of using tighter stop losses and whatnot then that's when things can really get offside so you know it's almost like being thrown in at the deep end i think on short term time frames it doesn't suit everyone but it but it suits me and what i find is longer term uh, investments that i may have possible well, I mean, particularly if they're unleveraged um, just buying traditional equities and stocks and things it becomes so much less stressful because it's like, you know, you've been uh, you've been hit hard. I guess it's like living in Spain for a while, then coming back to the UK. It, it doesn't feel as hot. Um, so a little bit about me then. I've been trading for about 11 years now. I found it in my, uh, my mid-20s, made all the trading errors, lost plenty of money, and then figured out I was either going to learn what to do or give up. I've been doing a live trade room for eight years. Um, 
slightly selfish reasons for continuing the live trade room as much as I do enjoy the community and interaction. It makes me a better trader because I can't trade live in front of someone and say, don't revenge trade and then do it myself. So it adds that degree of accountability that you'd find if you were, if you're an institution, you'd find accountability if you're in a bank or fund or anything like that prop firm, you may have a risk manager, you may have some accountability. And, and as a, as a retail trader sat at home, that accountability can be missing and, you can do all sorts of naughty things if you don't have to answer to anyone but yourself. Um, do some do some copy trading manager. Manage some talented uh, traders who do copy trading as as well. Some challenges with that of cost of carry and things, but we're still working through that. Scalper, as you well know, I do trade for a couple of uh, prop firms, and I do also specialize in passing funded trading tests. A lot of funded trading tests are very, very popular and have blown up on the pandemic. You'll know all the big names in the US and Europe probably. And, but the, most of them force you to be day traders as part of their business model because I know there's a higher probability of a day trader failing. But because I am a day trader, you know, one of the things I can do is, is, is pass those tests, which I've done on multiple occasions. So people do come to look at those funded trading tests. I always squint my left eye for some reason. I don't know why. Um, and we're doing a funded trading model, probably coming in Q3 um, uh, of, of this year. Um, we're just stress testing that at the moment. It's going to be completely different to anything else that out there. We're going to be asking people to take 125 trades. And if they get a certain amount right at a fixed risk reward ratio, then we're going to be able to in a position to give them a large sum of capital. So we're pretty, we're pretty excited about that. I am because hopefully it'll allow me to retire, but we'll see what happens with that. But that that's quite exciting. I've always wanted to um, be able to fund talented traders because there's plenty out there who just don't get the access to capital. I mean, how many people have got 50, 100, 200 grand to put in a trading account? Not many people. So uh, particularly about the account for mentioned accountability. So that's not too good. Um, so uh, as I alluded to in the introduction, when I was speaking about, um, you know, the only thing we really have control of is getting in and out of trades, or at least the vast majority of trades we take. I mean, obviously, there's potentially the market being closed, liquidity issues, depending on what market you trade. But generally speaking, most of you are probably trading CFD derivatives or, or similar to that. It's relatively easy to flow in and out of trades because the um, broker tends to take the heat on their side. Um, so, But the only thing that really matters is execution when it comes to trading. So what I, what I tried to say to people is to, is to sort of filter out the information that doesn't really enhance you getting in and out of a trade. You know, sometimes if I'm working with traders on a one-on-one -on -one basis, particularly if they've got sort of convoluted charts, because indicators, we can overload indicators for a variety of reasons, whether it gives us comfort, whether it allows us to blame the indicator if something goes wrong, if we're looking for an excuse to overtrade. We can find signals to get into a trade. If we're looking for an excuse to stay out of a trade because we're more fearful, then we can find reasons not to. So, so that's one practical example of where I'll say to people and sit them down and just say, look, you know, tell me why every single thing is on your chart. Justify how it supports your execution. What does that MACD do? What does that moving average do? That stochastic, the Bollinger Bands, the pivots, so on and so forth. There's so many indicators. And I say to people, look, justify to me why that matters. And then we can look broader than just the sort of charting software. We can say, well, what's your preparation plan for trading? You're going through Twitter and looking through 34 different needs, news feeds, um, probably with lots of different opinions about what the Fed may or may not do. How is that supporting your execution? And then if you want to go broader still and start looking at the type of stuff you might find, um, Steve Ward and people who often present on here um, talking about, they may, he may be talking about, so what's your sleep routine? How is that supporting your execution? What's your diet like? Are you hydrated? Are you well rested? Have you got distractions? Do you have a pre-market routine that's consistent that you can potentially tweak? So it depends on what level you want to take your trading to. And as, as far as I understand, working with people like Steve, you know, the people at the top level who we're competing about are, you know, de are trying to look at every aspect of their life to try and figure out if it supports or hinders the execution of their trades. Or investments, you know, there's people in banks. I've read studies who are who've literally had saliva samples taken to measure the cortisol levels. You know, we're talking about people who drill into it on a physiological level like that. So, you know, you might. So there's two ways to look at that. One is it can be quite intimidating and think, mm, I'm not going to do that. And the other one is, well, there's a lot of opportunity to up my game. So, you know, so that is a, it's a very powerful question that can sort of extrapolate onto all areas of your life, not just from the obvious charting and technical side but also your wider circumstances as well. And it's really important to trade to your own circumstances. You know, if you've got twin one-year-olds and who are keeping you up and giving you three hours sleep a night and you're working a nine to five job, 
then probably trying to scalp a one-minute or five-minute time frame is probably not the sensible thing to do. You probably want to be starting off at longer-term swing trades where you might get a couple of hours to do your analysis and, and look at patterns on a longer-term time frame that can be executed by orders and you can use alarms. So, you know, people say, what are the best strategies? What are the best time frames? Well, it, well, it all depends on your own circumstances and what suits you. Scalping's not uh, certainly for everyone. Um, and, and, and again, longer term trading isn't certainly for everyone as well. I don't generally don't want trades held overnight and over the weekends. I don't particularly worry about them, but it's just not not something that's ever resonated with me. So you've just got to consider your wider life circumstances and how they all link back to that uh, that powerful question. Now, when I talk about scalping and trading for an hour a day, I think I've just got one. Where's my pen? My virtual pen. Should I say I've got my real pen in my hand for some reason. Um, you know, I talk about an hour a day. I generally trade the US Open. I don't like getting up in mornings. I used to do shift work before I started trading um, in my old job. And I didn't like mornings, and I still don't. So I don't get up in the morning. I trade the US session. Um, and we're talking about little and often here. We're not talking about any life-changing sum that's going to be braggable on Instagram. We're just talking about little, free, little and often. This is back from February now. This is the 2nd, 3rd, 4th, and the 8th. Um, and, and there's a couple of things to highlight. Yeah, just little, little and often, you know, a couple of hundred dollars here and there. But when you're in the market potentially five to ten times a day, you don't want to be taking thousand dollar losses or three, you know three thousand dollars losses in a row. It's just going to derail you. Just little and often. Don't need to be greedy with it. But the thing I'm highlighting is the vast majority of my trades are, are taken within the first hour, which is between two two thirty and three thirty. So, I so it's the chicken and egg scenario. I didn't aim to take most of my trades in the first hour. Um, I'm going to stop drawing that. It's starting to look a bit inappropriate, but <laughs> that, that, no, it was a candle. That was better. But that was <laughs> Simon. You know, the vast majority of these times are in the first hour, um, and that's the, when I looked at my data. I was doing my analysis. So I do batch analysis. I don't do individual trade logs because I, I simply don't have the time um, to be charting and trading. So what you tend to find with high frequency trades, you do batch analysis over 50, 100 trades or something like that. And I was noticing that the vast majority of my trades were taken in the first hour. I mean, that's partly not, there's not a genius insight here. That's partly because I like to go to the gym after I've had a, after a few trades because I try and keep myself mentally focused and then come back a little bit later. But that's where the arrow came from uh, in, in this respect. And and this is what we're looking for here. Nothing, nothing too exciting, nothing too dramatic, but just a nice steady equity curve that's going to bring in some nice additional income for us, you know. We're not going to be buying yachts. We're not going to be outside Monte Carlo Casino. Um, I think I'm just conscious. I've literally just outlined the, the thing you can see there. But we're, we're, you know, we're looking to try and keep this drawdown minimum. We are going to have periods of drawdown, but we're just going to try and keep them um, as tamed as possible. You know, these are the points that are going to make or break you as a trader. I mean, you know, let's analyze these periods a little bit closer here. So back on trade 13, I believe that is you know, up until trade 19, it was just a sideways equity curve. So I had to sit there through, I don't know, five, six trades that could have taken over a couple of days and just have a sideways p and And now looking back in hindsight, it's like, well, it's only a few trades, isn't it? But we all know that when we're in the mix and we're actually trading, we get really suckered into the present moment, don't we? And that's even more true with scalping as well, because it can feel like there's opportunities over every second. So we need to just keep, we need to just try and keep that discipline, keep that perspective and just have a, I mean, you know, that this is quite a nice equity curve, but sometimes of course goes sideways and you might get a bit more drawdown. It might go sideways a bit more and that's the nature of the beast. But that I, I you know, su successful trading is often boring and then people who are new to trading don't want to hear that because it sounds like a bit of a thrill. Um, that's why people, I guess, want to get involved in, in the cryptocurrency craziness so much. But, you know, you know, I'm happy just to be to do boring equity curves, steady, consistent equity curves. That suits me to the ground. I'm not interested in boom and bust. I'm not interested in stuff, you know, 40% drawdown and 60% upswing. That That's not for me. I'm just happy to risk 1% or 2% of my account. So there's, there's two. I often get the question, what sort of account size do you need to trade? So there's two ways of answering it. One is you can have an account and trade a fixed percentage. You can have a 50,000 account and trade 1%, for example. Or what you could do is potentially um, take a load of trades at smaller size. The larger the sample, the better. And then you sort of get a, a volatility of your equity curve. You can wang a couple of standard deviations on there for those who uh, enjoy maths a little bit more. Uh, so maybe, I don't know, two, two or four X. And then you can sort of draw what that drawdown would be if it was more extreme. And you say, and then you can look at, say, you have, I don't know, $2,000 drawdown um, at your worst. 
Um, and then you can extrapolate that by position size. And then you can say, well, what sort of margin or account do I need in order to sustain that drawdown? So there are some people who may trade what you would you have, like, I don't know, a $20,000 account, and they trade a bit larger than what you'd expect. They may risk $500 a trade, but that's the process they've gone through in that respect. They just, they just front it with enough margin. So their returns look outrageous, but they've calculated it a slightly different way. It all depends, really. I mean, the golden rule of trading is live to fight another day, isn't it? You never want to be in a position where you can get taken out in a relatively short period of time. We've all been there. You know, I've blown plenty of accounts when I first started. It's the old uh, definition of madness, isn't it? Keep doing the same thing and expecting a different result, which is all a little bit crazy. Um, so the way we find it's pretty effective is, you know, the, 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 the three sort of components of trading. I mean, generally, it's looked at as, as having a strategy with an edge. Um, which is gets 99% of the attention. Everyone's interested in finding strategies. You do a webinar on, if I do, if I went live on YouTube and did a webinar on uh, technical analysis and indicators and strategies, it would get a lot more views than if I did one on psychology. But of course, anyone who has been trading a while will know that the trading psychology is what's going to make or break you, your ability to take a loss, your ability to run a winner, um, and, and just, just generally self-monitoring. Now, what you tend to find with trading psychology um, is that it, it's all a little bit rubbish, or, or sorry, a lot of it is a bit rubbish. There's actually some brilliant, uh, a lot of people have come over from a more sports science or background coming to trading a lot better. But the big hitters in it, you know, you do books like Trading the Zone and stuff like that, I don't think are of any value because they're talking about um, trading without fear. Now, the reality is we're very, very emotional creatures. And unless you're one in a million, maybe even higher, you're not going to trade about emotion, really, are you? Um, and if you look at the flash, flash, tr flash crash trader, he was probably able to trade about emotion um, because they thought he was on the, the spectrum. Um, interesting, read that. Uh, and it's like, well, yeah, if you perhaps have that level of, uh, you know, if you're in that mental state, if you like, then maybe you can. But for the vast majority of us functioning society, we have to trade with emotion. We have to embrace it. So the idea that you're going to trade without fear uh, is nonsense. Are you ever going to trade like you're trading a demo account is nonsense. So if, if you still believe that, I would encourage you to further pursue sort of more scientifically based trading psychology rather than ones that are written by traders who don't really know what we're talking about. And the final component that we that we like to do is live that is live trading as well, sort of bringing people together. I alluded to it earlier, the lack of accountability and of retail trading and, and the lack of community. So we want people we want people to be um, um, together and to support one another because that that tends to be quite an important thing. And of course, I mentioned already what I get out of it is that is the is that the accountability myself and it wants to it wants me drives me to be a better trader as well. Sometimes I, th I sort of think I'm just a bit happy, really, when it's like, well, really, I should be pushing myself. I'm encouraging people to improve themselves and push themselves, but I'm not doing it myself. Um, so it does that as well, giving me a kick up the backside as well. And I think in, in terms of a teaching context, nothing beats the demonstration of, of executing trades, because when you cut out the noise of it, that's the only thing that does matter. And that, that's what we talk about. And in our room, we do actual live trading. Um, I've been to some live trade rooms when I've been spying on competitors and it's all a little bit suggestive. Could have gone long here, could have gone short here. It's not really much use, much use. You know, just put your charts on screen, you know, and show you trading. Come on. Um, like I say, no, no suggestions are ambiguous style. Uh, trading education is really easy. I could make a trading course that I could sell, probably just narrate it uh, without even thinking and probably doing something else and package it up nicely and get it on YouTube and, and probably sell it. Very, very easy to do. Ex execution is, is, is very, very challenging to do. Um, so a lot easier to take the former ride. Uh, and I'll show you shortly with uh, some trade examples as well. And yeah, Simon's just put there in, in the chat, we do do a, a two-week trial if you want to come in our trade room and watch my business or my trading partner and I uh, trade also my business partner. So that's what we've uh, covered. We're nearly getting to the actual trades. Um, just trying to look how much PowerPoint I've got. I'm just conscious of time. What time is it? I said a quarter past um so we do i use simple charts i don't use charts like this you know i, I alluded to sort of technical indicators earlier and an analysis paralysis there's nothing wrong with using technical analysis of course people do get um you know a bit precious about their their trading strategies and and, and their setups i'm totally open-minded the only thing that matters in trading is consistently making money um however you do that is fine but for me i don't want my charts overloaded with with technical analysis and that's because nearly every indicator is a derivative of the open, high, low, and close. I mean, once you've 
once you've sort of, uh, I mean, once you've been watching price action for a while, you don't really need to, when the market sells off quickly or gets bought up very quickly, you don't really need to know that, uh, to see an RSI to know it's probably going to be going below 30 or above 70. I mean, you may have a mechanical strategy where you may use that as a trigger and that's a different matter. I don't, I just trade purely on the uh, on the price action here. And I look for really, really simple patterns, really simple charts that are just price action. Um, I use real market data on the cash charts, um, which I'll explain a little bit later. That's my anchor point. Um, and I have daily, weekly, and monthly pivots on my chart. I do like the uh, support and resistance pivots. I think they're very, very good on the stock indices, which is what I trade. Um, and I have a very simple 20, 10, 20, and 59 moving averages as well. Now, they're not primary decision makers, the moving averages, but you'd be remarkably surprised how much price action will bounce off a 10, 20. The 59 is practically a 60. It was a a back-tested strategy that gave us a 59 years ago, but we've just kept it ever since. But the 10 and 20 EMAs on things like the NASDAQ, the FTSE, the DAX, the S&P 500 tend to be the ones that have some sort of reaction. I don't necessarily trade them directly, but I might use them for putting stop losses above or below or profit targets and stuff like that um, in that respect. So my charts look, this is how my charts look, really, really simple. You know, just the price action. I use candlesticks. Some people use bar charts, support and resistance marked up. Um, the pivots and then the moving averages. It's really as simple as simple and clean as that. That's how I make all my all my decisions trading. Some people go a step further and they don't even um, have moving averages or anything on, but it all depends on what works for you, really. All depends on what works for you. Oh, my PowerPoint just disappeared. I uh, know uh, oh, this is my PowerPoint. I thought it was on my charts. Muppet. Um, I trade really simple price action patterns. Um, I find them the most consistent and, and the things I've been coming back to um, ever since uh, I started trading. It's interesting. I looked at, I've, I was looking through our old Dropbox and I found a trading webinar I did back in 2014. And I was taking exactly the same trade. So, you know, these are the most consistent I found through different market conditions. And and we've certainly seen a lot of significantly different market conditions over the past 10 years. Um, clearly, the last 18 months has redefined, I think, anything most of us have ever seen before. You know, the volatility of the coronavirus was was just on another level, wasn't it? Limiting down on the Dow like several times um crazy stuff crazy stuff so i think if you've survived over the past 18 months you're probably prepared for anything in fact you might find it boring in the future we'll have to see uh yeah some trades would take it for years as i just alluded to should really remember what's on these slides um i do support and resistance based trading essentially i think support and resistance is the foundation of trading personally and uh, everything can be done based off that and and the sort of trading i do works on different platforms i trade a futures platform i also trade a cft platform um, so it's suitable for those who want to do want to do both. If you're in the US, you're more limited. You're probably stuck to using a futures platform. If you're in Europe and most other places in the world, um, you've probably got the option of CFD trading, and of course, um, spread betting in the UK and uh, I think it's in Ireland as well, isn't it? Um, which uh, which is basically CFD trading under a different wrapper. Um, so, right. Any questions so far? Any points anyone wants to make? If not, we will crack on and start looking at some trades. Um, I've absolutely motored through that PowerPoint, but the trading is always more interesting than the PowerPoint. I will just get my charts up a second. Give me one, one moment. Uh, and we shall have a look. Should I say, I'll get my recordings up. Where are you? Is it hiding? There it is. It was hiding behind. Hang on, I've just opened my broker as well. I'm clicking all the wrong buttons. Right. Okay. So... I'm going to show so, I mean, some of these will be more repeatable than others. Some of them are a little bit intuitive. We talk about intuition in trading, and I, I believe intuition is possible in trading, where we're talking essentially talking about sub subconscious pattern recognition. It makes sense. I mean, I buy into Daniel Kahneman's definition of 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 um, of, uh, of, sub, of of intuition, which is talking about a repetitive environment that gives you quick feedback and trading is that i mean if we're trading technical patterns where we are saying the market's repeating itself so therefore we should be able to sort of embrace intuition and that's where you're getting this feeling that something's going to happen but you might not necessarily be able to define why on a conscious level and it's this your brain recognizing patterns subconsciously and those patterns re sort of manifesting themselves into into feelings and, and and the best traders i think can sort of access those feelings the problem is it's very fine margins because sometimes it's like your body you're just getting a temptation to trade so sometimes you've got to filter them out so some of these will be probably a little bit more intuition based some of them will be a little bit more um a little bit more uh, pattern basic pattern if you like so 
you know, what we're looking at here is, is the NASDAQ um, cash market here. You see this cash market. Ignore this demo at the top hand. That's just the analysis charts that don't have a live package through them. So just here, you've got that sense. This is like a slightly more intuition trade, into intuitive trade. So we just got the sense the momentum was coming out of the market on this trade. Uh, in in that respect, and it just had this slightly. I think it was probably looking back at it now, just this can this five minute candle here. The sellers just couldn't break this previous candle, and it's all looking a little bit wicky to me. Now that's a lovely term, isn't it? Wicky. Um, so so on this trade, we get into this is the trade actually in real time um, taken at the time here. Um, so we're just looking at a fib for potentially a profit taken. I'll do use fibs as well. There you go. Um, but it just looks like, I mean, the NASDAQ has quite an interesting characteristic. When it really starts getting going, it really starts getting going. And some of the patterns will be looking a little bit more obvious. And you can see, as I was taking this trade at the time in my trade room, that I'm talking about extensions and balance points that we're not talking today. So A is about equidistant to B, and you like to see some retracement. Um, so eventually the market comes back, and uh, what we were looking for is a break of that previous high, and then the market ends up, sort of running up a little bit higher and eventually hitting our profit our profit target on this trade. So this is a futures platform on the right hand side. That's why the prices are slightly different. Um, this is the the insist the prop firms that I trade for insist I use a futures platform. So eventually pops up, um, hits our profit target on that trade. Um, and that's just sensing a bit of momentum coming out of the market and using a basic price action pattern. It's not the most obvious one, probably not the best one to start with. So we'll look at some others. Okay, so we've got a triangle wedge happening here, a very common sort of price action pattern where we've got the market opening. This is the Dow Jones Industrial Average. It rejects the high. It comes back down. And we see, you know, every time the market's coming back down, we're starting to see buyers come into the market. The sellers are, start, are, are starting to exhaust every time they're coming back down on this market. And it's pressing up against this previous 4-3 resistance line. So in my judgment, that looks like a classic sort of uh, triangle wedge that's happening. It's not quite the a flag formation because it's got all this noise up here but it looks like it was going to pop back up for me so uh, we'll get into the actual trade now oh, this is actually a little bit further on in the trade here i didn't actually have the beginning of this recorded but you can see here how um we get on a preemptive breakout here um we can see the market wedging up take our entry here so there's different ways you can take a triangle breakout you can wait for a new high or if you're a little bit more adventurous you can take it on a preemptive break and on this occasion um, we took it on a preemptive break uh, on that occasion. It ends up hitting our profit target quite nicely. Now, the most basic of price action patterns that some people find a bit funny because it's one of the first one you lose, a simple double top. A simple double top. In fact, it's a triple top. It's a triple top, isn't it, this one, over over several days on a five-minute time frame. And, you know, it, and it's, let's say, simple price action. What's the market telling you when it gets up to 31,643? Sellers, no more buyers. Sellers, no more buyers. So the question I would say from a practical point of view is when you see the Dow rally from 31,300 up to 31,640, pretty much in a straight line, reverse your trade. I say I'm going to get short here, but in my head, what if I get long? What if I get long at the first test of this level again? And I put my and I put my limit where my stop is and my stop is where my limit is. So just take a minute to think about that. I want to get short. I want to put my stop, you know, probably wherever I want to put my limit here. I want to put my entry here. Now, reverse that for a second and say to yourself, on the first test of this level, do I want to buy it again um, and, and anticipate a breakout after a 340-odd point rally in a day? Um, and, you know, if the answer is maybe, then maybe you don't take the trade. Um, you know, if the answer is, yeah, the long looks good, then maybe you don't take the short. So that's quite a good practical way to sort of challenge yourself and play devil's advocate because you might not have someone else to do it. Um, but I think this was, yeah, a really quick scalp on, on this, um, a really quick scalp on this level. Uh, oh no, I don't actually have that one. Mm -mm, beg your pardon. Let's go back and talk about another one. I don't know why that one's net there. Okay, so we're talking about contrarian trades on, on this occasion. Um, and uh, what we're looking at here are the round numbers on the Dow. Now, if you've never if you've never sort of um, spoken about the round numbers before, it's 31, 200, 300, 400, 500 on the Dow are all quite sort of valid levels. Um, you'll look at support and resistance. You'll have to find the market will reverse it or stall at them. It will go to them so you can set stop losses, entry, and profit targets around them. 
Now, this brings in the pivot as well. Now, if you have a look here, there's an S1 weekly pivot, not quite as strong as the daily pivots for five-minute scalping, but that's that's confluence when two or more things align with each other that suggest something's going to happen. So let's have a talk through this trade. This trade's interesting because we can give this some psychological context as well. So I get long here, um, anticipating the market's going to bounce at this S1 level. Um, so that so I enter the trade up here, and you can see I'm minus nine as this recording starts. Now, what I do is I set my stop loss below these two lows because these are previous support levels. So between your entry and stop loss, you want to reasonably throw as many walls in the way as possible. You know, so I've got the round number, I've got the pivot, I've got two previous support levels. So I want as many walls in the way as possible. Obviously, I don't want to run a 400-point stop for a 20-point limit. That's ridiculous. But I want as many reasonable walls in the way as possible when, when placing my stop loss. And, and as you can see, this trade goes against me. This trade goes against me. It starts coming down uh, even further uh, on this on this occasion. And we end up I'm trying to think what's the most negative we get on this trade. Uh, about minus 20 on this trade. So we get about minus 20 on this trade, and it's pretty much gone straight away. That first spike candle is before we entered the trade. So we've got about minus 20 on this trade. So what, you know, in the chat, what do you think you're feeling on this? What What's the emotion you're feeling on this trade when you're at minus 20? You know, let's talk about what we're actually going to feel when we're trading, regardless of leverage, regardless of account size, regardless of anything else. What are the sort of things? There must be one person in the room who can tell me what we're potentially going to feel when we're in a losing position like this. If not, I'll fill it in for you. <laughs> I'll give you a few more seconds to have a drink. Close the trade. Yeah, that's the action. But what's the feeling that's going to cause us to close the trade? Fear. Yeah, the fear is going to cause us to close the trade. So then the next thing, and tell me, tell me if anyone's done this before, is the market then comes back to, uh, goes down to minus 22 again, then it goes to zero. What's the potential feeling here and the potential action that we take? We've been minus 20, we now get back to break even. What, what have you done? What have you done that it feels like you've done it a million times? The trade's gone against you, it's come back to break even. What have you done? So I can tell you what I've done a million times. I'll give you a couple more seconds. And I'll tell you now. I've closed the trade. I've closed the trade. And that is a very common thing. And you've got to think about it. If you're putting a stop loss in the market, then why are you putting a stop loss? You know, if you're putting a stop loss down here, then you're telling, you're saying to yourself, you're willing to let the price action come down here. You know, if you're only willing to let it come to minus five or you thought it was going to be an instant winner, then you would treat it like that. So if you're going to put a stop loss in the market, then you need to make sure you're willing to let the trade go into that and spend some time in that area. Not every trade's going to turn around on a dime. Sometimes you nail it, a lot of the times you don't. Um, and of course, if you close it now, you then miss the you then the, miss the two profit targets getting hit, and you get really annoyed. It actually turns out, of course, the better entry was down here on this previous support level for a double bottom. But because I because I planned that in the trade and I put my stop below these previous support levels, I was able to ride a little bit of pain and discomfort because it is uncomfortable being in a losing position. There's nothing wrong with being uncomfortable in a trade. You know, that that's the reality of being an emotional creature. But what you didn't see me do is make a trading error. I didn't snatch it when it came back to break even. Um, the market came back and I rode it. I stuck to my plan and it hit my profit target. So, you know, Nice one in that respect. Now, this is in this is interesting. Let me just make sure it is actually the right bloody one. Um, <laughs> this is interesting because this just shows how scalping can work even when a level doesn't hold. If you identify the right levels, then what you'll find this is a basic double top again, actually a double top this time. Um, you know, this 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 level broke. You know, if you're looking at a 15, an hourly, or anything like that, that level has just broken up and not held. Um, so but at the same time, we can still profit from that because what you tend to find is even when a market's up or down trending, if you're identifying the correct support and resistance levels and you're watching the price action to stall at the level, I only do manual entries. I don't do any um, orders. And you can see the market comes up here. It stalls and it comes down. And we're able just to snatch a little bit of profit. Of course, in hindsight, we'd want to just be long and, and take the break. But you know, hindsight's pretty difficult. So it comes down, it comes, the market comes up here. We're looking at this bottom middle chart here on the S&P 500. We've got a Fibonacci retracement on it as well that gives us confluence. Not sure where it's pulled from. We've got it marked up on our trade plan. 
Um, very basic boxes we use here to say that. 50% short on the SPX. And then we'll play this again in uh, real time. You lost your connection, but your platform is working. I'm not getting any issues my end. Um, I think my internet's working pretty fine. Just, does anyone else have any connection issues? The buffering. Uh, give me two seconds. Let's see if it's my end. Mine, uh, okay. Mine seems to be okay at this end. Sure, um, uh, my internet okay. looks pretty good to me, but I'll just double check. There's no issues. Okay, we'll just hold on a second. Can you hear me? Um, speaking, everybody. Uh, normally, when this happens, it just returns to normal. It's just a glitch. Um, okay, so we seem to have about half and half. Some people experiencing issues. We good? I don't, yeah, are we all good? Okay, right. Yeah, I just I just yeah. had a look, and it looked like it was like mine. Just with several people. That's all. I was just concerned it was mine. Anyway. So we're looking for this um, this market to come up here potentially to that uh, 3872 level. So we'll just play this trade. Uh, market starts coming up here. Uh, we see the market start stalling and laying the most subtle little wicks. Then we get short on the market. We initially have our stop loss up here. I'm hoping I bring my stop loss in. I can't remember. I do that many trades. And then we're just waiting to see if we get a little reaction. Now, remember, obviously, what happens in, in hindsight is this just blasts up. But we don't know that happens. So... So we've got getting a sort of reaction from the level here. Uh, it's going against us a little bit, um, but we can still see the cash market hasn't hasn't broken up yet. Tend to find you get a little bit of divergence from the cash and futures market for various boring reasons. Uh, and it's starting to make higher highs. So that's starting to make me think, well, do I want to be in this trade anymore? But again, the cash market is still holding below. It just looks like we haven't got the optimum entry here uh, on the, uh, on the uh, futures market. But eventually... What we see here is a bit of a a bit of a uh, a trap for the buyers initially. Um, so you talk about short squeezes, you can also have the reverse as well. So all the people who are buying contracts up here, hoping the market's going to get up, eventually um, they get exhausted. And what we then see here is a quick change in liquidity, a quick change in momentum, and it happens quite quickly. As all you see how this is happening now, very quickly, you know, either the people who are in their long positions are abandoning them so it's happening or people who are wanting to sell are coming in in droves now what you'll also see here is some active trade management so the stop loss is out of the way up here at the moment i'm not probably willing to let it go that far offside it's just out of the way but as soon as we start seeing the trade come to a position we then move our stop loss in i've just moved my stop loss in now stop loss management is quite a complex subject and it can really make or break your trading success but what i would say is um you know the question I, I always try and get traders to ask practical questions. The same way I get them to ask the question of whether um, you should be, you know, whether you want to take the opposite direction. Um, for example, I always say to them, "Where don't you want the market to go? You know, where where is the where is the market going to go that's going to invalidate your trade that makes it not worth staying in the trade anymore?" Now you can see here as this stop loss gets changed, you know, I decide at this moment in time. I don't want the market to start make a new high. If the market makes a new high, I think there's a good probability it's going to break up. So what I do is I move my stop loss in about a tick above the high. And then, you know, that that means if the trade comes back up, you know, I, I take a lesser loss because I judge there's a higher probability of it then starting to rally up. Of course, it could come up and then come down. You know, that's the nature of the beast. But one of the key ways to profitability isn't to make more money. It's sometimes to lose less. Now, the vast majority of traders I work with have a higher average loss than average win on their trade. Now, that varies by win percentage. If the higher the win percentage, generally the smaller win, uh, the larger the loss. And, and if you're profitable, because misconception, you don't need to win 50% of your trades to be profitable. There's plenty of traders who win less than that, but they have much larger winners. For example, on a two-hour strategy, you need to win a third of your trades, for example. So I know people who trade at 40 43% on a two-hour strategy, and they will um, they make a good living from that. They've got a good edge. Um, but eventually, um, this does continue to, to come down and uh, takes a little bit of time. Once we get to plus 15 ticks, I think it is, it goes to auto break even anyway. Hits our first profit target. But on this occasion, um, it comes and takes a stop break even, then breaks out. So, I mean, this, there's a lot of points to be made from this trade. The second one is scaling out. This is two contracts short on the S&P. Um, I've got one contract here. 
at 3860 spot 25. I've got a more ambitious contract down here at 3852 spot 75. Um, so, you know, I don't want to go through all the, the stress and uh, of taking a trade and having a having a little reaction, not a massive reaction. It's a few, it's a couple of points, a few ticks. So we bank some profit there. And uh, and then it eventually comes and stops us break out. So all that effort and focus uh, of that trade has been rewarded. And as we saw on this screenshot, it then ended up just rallying up and breaking up anyway. So the point, there's loads of points we made from that trade. It's a really good one to to talk about, um, even though it's a very very simple price action pattern. Is you know looking for the market to find resistance, even if it, you know if you still get little bounces, even if the trend goes against you. Um, active stop management and of course. Um, taking profit um, when it's offered to you, and but at the same time scaling out. Or I would always advocate scaling out. It depends on your strategies, of course, but generally I find that scaling out is an advantageous thing to do because you've always got that stress if you're in a trade, haven't you? And you have not taken any profit because you, you're anticipating the regret of it going back against you. But at the same time, you get the fear of missing out if it carries on going in the same way. So scaling out can help um, manage those feelings, if you like, if you suffer from those. What's up next? Uh, let me see what this one is. Has this got much value? Uh, okay, yeah. This is a. This was a. Uh, this is a good example of a smaller loss. This is a pivot reversal on the on the Nasdaq. You can see here on the bottom left, you've got the black horizontal line, and we've got daily pivot long. We've got monthly pivot. That's, that's a trade plan on the Nasdaq. We're anticipating this market to um, bounce off this level, so we get long here. Um, and then we see a little reaction off this trade. And again, where don't we want the market to go? Um, and it gets relative. Yeah, we see six points of profit there on the NASDAQ, uh, which is a decent little bounce. I don't know, one, even at one contract, it's not too bad a size. Um, and then so we move our stop loss down um, because we think, well, if it's not, if it's going to bounce, the NASDAQ generally moves pretty quickly if, it, if it's going to have a reaction. And we're either going to hit our profit target or we're going to hit our stop loss uh, on this occasion. You can see on this occasion, it comes down and it, and it pings a stop loss. I don't actually have the screenshot for what happened after, but on that occasion, hit a stop loss. Oh, you can see there, it ends up breaking through significantly towards the end of the video. So we take a small loss you know, of about four points. The market breaks down significantly, starts breaking down significantly. We can see that I think it ended up opening up this level down here. So again, that's the advantage of, of active trade management when it's done properly, is you end up taking a smaller loss uh, in that respect. So I've shown you the uh, highly complex double top. I think it's about time you have a double bottom as well. And you're seeing this is just repetition, repetition of patterns, repetition of executions time and time again. Uh, these patterns will work. And they're so, they don't have to be complicated. Why complicate trading? You know, I think that's a pretty crazy thing to do. Um, just see how this one plays out. But it's, it's again, it's all similar principle stuff. Um, we see the market come down. Don't get the best entry. Because if, let's have a look at this. Let's let's focus on this reaction here. I'm just going to zoom into this. This is this is where I make my decisions from. So we'll try and make a slightly different point here. Now, when we look for the market to come down on a scalping time frame, look for it to come down quickly into the level. Like trading isn't physics. It doesn't mean it's heavy or it's got loads of mass to it. It's not going to smash through. It's not got inertia. You know, liquidity can change on a dime. Market comes down. We're looking for a stall on the level. Little indication that the buyers are coming in the market and we're getting that bull and bear battle um, on the short term time frame. And then we're deciding to execute. So there's that benefit, there's that balance between confirmation, where you're waiting to see the market stall, lay a bit of a wick, versus opportunity, where you take it the first time it gets into a level. But the advantage of manual trading is if it just smashes through the level and doesn't look back, then you don't get into the trade. You don't take the trade. So let's just watch this in real time. Market comes down. Uh, and we're not going to jump the gun. It comes into the level. Nice. Got stalled. Bang. Little wick straight away. You just see that very, very subtle bit of price action there. It's literally... Um, probably a tick. So we go there uh, into the level. And a second, I'm just getting the uh, the swirly symbol of death on my video recording. All right, it's back now. And then um, there it goes there. Little wick there. And I think, do I enter on that candle? Or just slightly after? The futures market, been the sod that it is, has already laid a bigger wick. Interesting enough, the S&P is coming down for a double bottom. Um, so we get, I think we get long. Yeah, we get long there. Um where, uh, like I said, the futures market's been a, been a bit mischievous and done a larger wick um, of about 13 points, whereas the future, whereas the cash market hasn't. So we get long on that trade. It's not the best entry, but I don't think I could have really done better unless I was trading order. And you know, the market ends up coming up, um, starts to push back down, makes a new low that's a bit naughty, not a new a fractional new low on the cash market. This is the problem sometimes where you don't get an optimum entry. It can put you underwater. And eventually... 
Um, we see a lovely little wick here. Again, what's this telling us? This is telling us that the sellers are getting exhausted. They're starting to get squeezed and uh, the buyers are happy. Um, and again, what we're talking about, trade management, consistency. You know, I don't want the market to make a new low. Hang on a second. I'm just getting my video uh, software not um, being very just, happy. Just going to give you a, a sort of a five-minute um, alert, if that's okay. Yeah, no problem. No problem. I can stop at any time with these um, with these videos. So anyway, market pops up, and eventually um, we get both our profit or certainly both our profit targets hit there. Or I think I've decided discretionary to take profit. So that that's an example. Let me try and find something that's a little bit different from my last example um, than 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 the, just those ones. And uh, and then we'll see if we can end on a end on a nice one. Uh, I think the, I think this is probably from my, my my double top and double bottom video. To be fair, so it's probably going to be relatively limited in terms of trades. I'm trying to find out if we find a slightly alternative entry. Uh, uh, this this one's not too bad to end on. I mean, it's, it's it's similar, just sort of trading a support level, but it just shows you a bit of a fake out um, and how and and how you can get stop hunted or or not on this occasion. You can see here how the market. Obviously, I've entered the market. Look, probably has stalled. And then it pops down here. The more time it spends below the level, the less inclined we are to stay on that level. But on this occasion, you can see here, this is tricking all the people who want to sell the market down. And then, of course, all, all the buyers start coming in. And eventually, once the liquidity goes, it uh, ends up popping up and uh, hitting our profit target eventually. I think it does eventually. Last question then. So let's, let's zoom in on this bad boy. Um, so what happens here? That what happens here? Market goes up, it gets within. I can't, I've not even got it recorded, it happened that fast. Gets within one tick of a profit target, and then it starts doing this. And what happens? What happens when it does that? It gets within one tick or one point of your profit target, and then it rolls back over and comes back down and retraces. What, what are you thinking or feeling here? Give me a quick answer before I end. So, just so you understand the price action, market comes up, nearly hits a profit target. And then it doesn't, and it starts rolling over. What do you do? I know what you do, so I'll tell you in a second. Because I've only got a couple of minutes left. You close the trade because you're scared the trade is going to go all the way to the bottom. And invariably, when you close the trade, what happens? It then goes back up and hits your profit target. <laughs> and we've all done that. And it's very difficult to let $600 that you make in five minutes you know remember these time frames here you might not think well it's not gonna buy me a lamborghini but that's uh that's a trade that's taken five minutes i'm quite happy to get paid that much in five minutes um so that's pretty good really uh, let's get rid of those videos and go back to my little powerpoint and i'll round things off so i think simon sent you the link um you're welcome to come to our trade room obviously i've rushed through things today but of course that's not the reality when we're actually in the uh in the trade room um, we're obviously uh, trading a lot more free. We're obviously breaking down everything and looking at things in real time and explaining them to a greater degree. So you're welcome to come and trial us for um, 14 days. I'll be trading live this afternoon. It'll be a slightly shorter session because I need to get my second COVID jab today. Um, but we do trade every day. My business, my trading and business partner trades in the morning doing slightly large, longer term swing trades on gold and forex and stuff like that. And I do scalping in the afternoon. I do it live every day. Um, so come and join us. Have a chat of our community. I'm not going to try and sell you any expensive courses or any nonsense like that. We're just there to take some honest trades, discuss them, and manage them regardless of whether the winners, losers, or break even. It really is that simple. So I do appreciate you uh, listening to me today and uh, for all the comments and questions and uh, figuring out how to fix it when it breaks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've had our first technical glitch, um, which was good. Uh, so Never to be out for us, it? <laughs> Alex helped us out there, and I think a few of you just had to refresh using the F5 key. Um, so, so far, so good. Simon, thank you for that. Always good to have you here. And again, there's that link. I know that that's not the link that you um, provide with, but it links to the to the uh, the page on our website, which has the your 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 special link, so people can get that special 14 day um, free trial in in the room. And again, I I think. There's no credit card to put in or anything on that, which is great. Just literally just, just, just sign in with your name uh, and you can go and join Simon and the guys to, to see how it's how it works in there um, for two whole weeks, uh, which is terrific. Simon, thank you for joining us again. Um, good luck with the second jab. 
and that'll be fully vaxxed. <laughs> You'll be free. And I, I, I read today that they're they're going to allow people to take holidays after all. To well, I hope so. I was meant to be in Portugal two weeks ago, and I had to cancel it because I couldn't be quarantining for ten days. So that was disappointing. But oh uh, well, and, and now <laughs> they're changing the rules yet again. What a surprise! Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think there's a couple well, of questions to mop up. Yeah. Uh, time frames I use five minute generally. Um, quick question: What is realistic percentage, percentage terms? Depends on your risk drawdown tolerance. Um, I like I say earlier on, I tend not to focus in percentage. It's a case of here's my equity curve. How much do I want to risk per trade? How much drawdown is that going to give me? And then you can calculate percentage terms relative to your account size if you want, or you can do it in the fixed way, where you're looking at I've got X accounts and I'm going to risk X percentage. So it, it depends on which on which way you do it. I tend to leverage quite high. Um, relative to the amount of money I put for the margin, because I'm very confident with how much drawdown I'm likely to explore, and then I extrapolate that by two or by two times to give a big margin of error as well. Fantastic. Okay. Um, thanks, Wayne, for your comment um, as well. Ash as well, and James. Great. Okay. I think uh, we'll say thanks very much, Simon um, Massey from Trade Room Plus. I will um, take back the the screen um, if I can and we're going to move ahead to our next speaker of the day so I'll share my screen now uh, Simon thanks very much I think you just toggle your video cam and your microphone off and uh, and we're done so thanks for sticking with it and uh, uh, yeah thanks software. Simon take care we'll see you soon take bye -bye. care bye bye Okay, um, okay, we should be able to, um, oh, there's me, we are just waiting for my screen to share, and then we're going to go right along to our next speaker, which is Francis, Francis Hunt, the market sniper. Um, Francis is in the room already. Now, one thing I'm discovering is that it takes just uh, a few seconds longer than the old GoToWebinar um, pack did. That's one of the one of the concessions um, that we made. The, 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 I'm comparing the two platforms, the two webinar platforms, and there's various pros and various uh, cons of, of each. So as we go through, this is uh, useful for comparing. And contrasting that but it's okay so far I think we're all seeing and hearing and um, we've got the chat box there's Francis in the chat room which is great uh, hi everyone he says the hunt volatility funnel that's what Wayne's uh, dropped that in the HBF Francis will tell us about that in just a second um, before we uh, go along I must just uh, quickly mention our sponsors again for today um, td365.com there is an offer um, for everybody that just opens an account, um, it's free to open an account, but you will, as part of that, be sent a full uh, trading course by Al Brooks, who is the, the legendary sort of technical trader. Um, so it's two price action trading courses um, that you'll get free of charge. And in order to, to do that, in order to sign up and, and get that, you just need to click on the button at the bottom of your screen, it should say, get your free Al Brooks Price Action course here. Um, that'll take you through to the website. So thanks again to TD365 for that. Right, we are just going to go right on ahead to our next speaker of the day, um, who is Francis Hunt. There he is, crypto trading. Um, one of the top 100 crypto influencers. Um, and he is in the room, so I'm going to just uh, send the invite for him to come up onto the stage, and then hopefully we'll be able to share screens. Yes, Adrian says, con, Simon had to reboot several times, um, some lack of video freeze and other lost sound. Yeah, there's definitely some... Um, some glitches with doing on this other platform but um, we'll stick with it um, for the moment see how we get on so Francis uh, in just a few seconds should be able to join us
I will stop sharing. See if that makes it easier. Oh. Okay, I can see France is coming in now, so. Uh, oh well today we're just we're just crossing over speakers welcome if you're just joining us and here we have um market sniper himself yes um, looking very sharp i like the glasses how are <laughs> you francis welcome thank you yes indeed gamer glasses i have to say not uh lens ones but, uh because of the computer time i'm trying to protect the eyes nowadays um uh, got to get off those damn screens and you've got to also reduce the blue light so forgive me for that um but yeah looking forward to the session and delighted to be with you guys hopefully we can give you a good one i'm sure you will um thank you for joining us now francis before we get started let's uh, we can hear and see you um what we need to do now is, is to share screen so if you take your mouse and hover it over your own webcam picture you should have a a, yes. sort of a, a little screen with an arrow in there and that should share your screen indeed and let's just move that one to the left side so we've got um there we go that's looking promising uh i think we're coming there let's go to charts uh very good thank you welcome to everybody um i'm excited to be with you uh thanks to round the clock trader for putting on the event and also for inviting me uh i've got 45 minutes and i've got so much to share i think I'm, it's going to be fast paced and hopefully exciting for you as well uh so i'm going to jump straight in and not waste any time so small but small background for those that don't know me i'm actually a long-standing trader i've been i'm doing a crypto segment because i, I believe that's an unrepresented segment for simon's particular area but I've been trading FX commodities, equities for an extended period around 35 odd years. I don't think time really matters too much. You can you can do a lot of damage in a lot of time. Um, uh, my my uh, approach is the hunt volatility funnel method, which is a self derived approach. So I'll, I'll make some references to that, but that's all I'm going to largely say. Uh, in terms of that. Uh, why crypto markets? Um, we'll cover a little bit on that. And uh, you might ask, well, why are you starting with an FX uh, chart right now? Um, I'll cover that as well. So in essence, uh, I am what I call a 360 degree trader. I look fundamentally, so I understand fundamentals, but I trade technically. Uh, I look fundamentally at the global system and assess that we're in a, a synchronized, globalized fiat failure shell game um which is a hyper over indebted uh globe uh and as a result i consider this uh, and i say what does that mean um well it means a number of things to me it means uh we're going to have uh, a large amount of in inflation which is the creation of money we've already seen that happen um and it's going to be uh in the dollar, it's going to be in all the different currencies. Uh, normally, when you have an inflation crisis, you have something like Venezuela or Zimbabwe, and it's all about that localized area that's destroyed currency relative to everybody else. What's actually happened now is we have this unique economic experiment where there's been very little difference in opinion. All debt is good. Uh, borrow, borrow, borrow. Create this debt bubble that we have. Uh, and as a result, uh, we have synchronized over indebted nations they're all largely synchronized so it's difficult to spot it's a clever game that's being played because what actually happens is if everyone's a leper in the leper colony nobody knows what it means to be healthy because you've never seen someone that is healthy so we are we're, we're practicing leprosy in a leper colony in my worldview so what's this all got to do with crypto and why we will be discussing crypto um, in my macro fundamental understanding, we are going to see the surrender of the current financial system as it's currently run. I don't know in what form it takes. I'm not clairvoyant. Um, it could be a jubilee on all debt. could be a variety of things. The things the World Economic Forum say about owning nothing uh, and being uh, high on uh, pharmaceuticals doesn't particularly excite me uh, and being so happy. So this leads to what is going to be the replacement system for fiat. Um, and one of the conclusions I came to is that this item called blockchain, how much that will involve Bitcoin and some of the, the current 
tokens is a, a separate discussion within that. But uh, this notion of open source bank accounts is likely to appeal very much to central bankers because that's in fact what blockchain is. Forget all you heard about privacy. Um, every wallet can be monitored. Every uh, transaction has a TIX ID. It is basically a, a combination uh, of databases that are all connected up that carry bits and pieces of information on every key transaction. And they can all be searched, incomes, etc. So that's, I'm not going to do the whole uh, crypto thing. You are traders, you want to know how to make money. Um, and I'm telling you why I'm interested in the space. And I do a fair amount of my trading, in fact, a high amount in the space. However, I still watch uh, silver and gold, which are similar anti-fiats in my worldview. I watch oil, which is a, one of the most key commodity markets in my view. I'm known for calling the crash in 2019 to single digits from a platform stage uh, and was referring to that for four or five months before that led to being what is known as the COVID uh, pandemic crash of oil. We were disproportionately very long gold and there was a huge swing. Gold, of course, started its journey to the $2,000 mark during that period, uh, but also had a dip on the deflationary news. So uh, anti-fiats are of interest and then seeing the currencies movements relative to each other. So the global macro element hasn't gone away because I'm existing also in crypto. Crypto gives very clean charts. Um, particularly, and if providing you are trading in the suitably liquid um, tokens, you're going to be just 100% uh, fine. Um, and so technically, I like it. So why have we started with a rounded bottom on the USD CAD? Well, actually, I think the dollar, I'm going to make an outrageous statement, the dollar that has been serially weak is currently uh, possibly making a turn that will sustain for much longer than people think. In other words, you've all got used to dollar weakness, and I'm about to say that maybe it's going to get strong for an extended period. Uh, in actual fact, we've had guests on our show called Brent Johnson, who talks about the dollar milkshake theory, and that because of Triffin's dilemma, which is a difficult thing to explain, and we don't have the time to do, but essentially um, the country that holds the, the the state of currency for the globe typically has to continue to print and run deficits. That's basically the fundamentals of Chiffin's dilemma. So they are always having to issue dollars because the rest of the world has demand for them because commodities are priced in them. Um, in that event, the dollar is definitely one of the, the, the key currencies. So why would someone say it's going to go up? This is a beautiful textbook rounded bottom, by the way. And you can see how Canada's done rather well. So this is the USD CAD. But let's go to a more recognized dollar measure. Um, and that is the dollar index. And I'm going to just show you a couple of things on the bigger time frame and why we have to understand this to understand uh, crypto a little bit. Um, so if we just uh, hide uh, this, it's my overall view that we are resisting running this technical low that existed here from 2018. There's a technical low. I've just highlighted it. Um, and the 90 level seems to be a relative place of support. This was a most disorderly descent. A lot of money was created, particularly in America. The stimulus checks, uh, the bailouts for businesses, various other aspects. Not to say it hasn't happened in the UK. I know many of you will be from the UK. Glad to be uh, in touch with you and spend many years there. Um, and uh, we have obviously been doing the, the payment of the taxi drivers. What are they called again with the, with the F? It's the, um, the whatever scheme, uh, the word skipped my mind, but it's kind of the equivalent of stimulus checks. I know in the Eurozone things have been done, but the dollar has actually done the most. And this led this huge, huge slide. What's recently happened macroeconomically is that everybody's run to my side of the ship and that makes me nervous. We were an inflationist 18 months ago as the COVID event happened, as this dollar spike occurred that was a final melt up before a capitulation. Why were we an inflationist? Because the policies that they were bringing to save the problem was fiat creation. This all ties to crypto, fiat creation, scarcity versus proliferation. So we're getting there. You've just got to let me take you a little bit a long way around and around the rose bush so that you get the conceptual thinking and then we'll dive into the crypto charts. So with that uh, proliferation fiat model and supposed scarcity on a crypto model, you should have uh, a, a sense that one thing will eventually be proliferating to its own death and deflate and something else is being inflated up in value. So one asset is having the air let out and another one is being expanded. And that's what I think the process is currently going on right now. The fresh horse has arrived, the tired donkey is about to fall over with a heart attack and people are jumping off the back. You can decide to be an early adopter 
and get some of that huge gains or you can be late near the end when everyone else knows what's going on and you could have missed out with this deflation reflation opportunity that i see is probably going to transpire that is why we engage in crypto many people scam it's for buying ak-47 selling heroin taking out hits uh, i'm afraid there's a lot of fantasia and nonsense in there um and cash is the best for that and that's been in existence for many many years and is utterly untrackable so could the dollar be actually about a move and a longer term view potentially even do something that's and this is a very oily call it barely it's not even a w bottom yet uh so it's high risk of course it's preemptive um but why would they do that well because everybody is talking about inflation in america and the fed right now is being made to look rather stupid and central bankers don't like that so how do they stop looking so inflationary they push the dollar up that kills the price of lumber in dollars that reduces the rate of ascent in oil they stamped on gold and silver last night as you probably would have heard already by now the other anti-fiats and what does this actually do well the oil the 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 gold and the silver actually didn't do so bad against the euro why because the euro usd is now taking the weakness so you hide your own country's inflation because most of the references to inflation uh, are being directed mainly at america but considered globally but particularly at the, the global currency of all but if we take a little pop over to the euro uh, what we actually see is that the euro usd has been spilling pretty hard uh, since these highs uh, and we've largely been in a range since the fifth, uh, 2015, and in fact, you could argue you fell into that range, uh, the 2515 range, which is essentially uh, a tied box market for me, which has allowed a larger box, something like this, to trade in. I could draw it a little more accurately and a little fatter to ensure you all get my drift, um, but that would probably be um, the box range that we've had. And we're on the high side. I like to split things uh, and talk about the midpoint um, which might be the, round, the level around which we pivot. And we'll change color just so that you can contrast it nicely. And you probably come out, whoops, that's still a box. Um, you'll probably come out at around the 15 level because you're at about 105 to about 125. Let's see roughly just naked eye where we're coming out. There, the 115 level. So this has been almost a sine wave pivot if we talk about uh, the euro versus the USD. And we're on the quite high extreme point of the uh, box range that has been permitted for us in terms of these big currencies. Now, what's good for the dollar is usually bad for the uh, euro and what's good for the euro is, is often bad for the dollar. So expect news that's going to focus more on the euro problems that might be the banking system, the, the cost to tourism of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and we're going to see less inflation data in America as they push the dollar up and more of that inflation is now being pushed onto the other currencies that will now weaken and have to buy oil, gold, silver and other commodities uh, in a, a, a less strong currency. This hides the fact to many of the inflation because America will say, you see, we back down again. All that's actually happened is we passed the inflation on. So inflation repolicies are what are killing uh, fiat. Some of you will say, but, but, but deflation. Um, deflation, there will be def deflationary shocks throughout this process to shake us off the game. The minute you create new fiat, you are inflating. Inflation isn't the price of bread and the price of milk at your local 7-Eleven down the road. Inflation is the increase in circulation of money. Yes, some of you might say, but the velocity is dropping. The velocity is dropping. Well, it has, and it's compensated a large degree. That's because all the billionaires in the corporate class got the money, but now they're paying stimulus checks direct to people. And um, furlough is the F word I couldn't find. Um, there's other F words I find rather easily, but furlough was the one that was catching me. Um, furlough is the also happening in the UK, etc. So this is now giving to the people that are likely to consume money more, rather who are already investors and will just buy more equity stock and destroy the, 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 the power of movement. So this brings us to crypto. So let's get on with, with the crypto, but I wanted you just to understand a few basic fundamentals about how the economic system works and how we have defined the era since COVID. COVID is a bookmarking event that is the great long. This is the great inflationary long. And all the way up, you will have some harsh and nasty uh, sell-offs that will be deflationary events that will be second third variant fourth variant narrative maybe on the COVID or, or hacking anything else Klaus Schwab wants to drop on your head 
or any other random events that are attacking the economy, such as a European bank being declared bankrupt or needing a bailout, etc., etc. So there will be deflationary events, but those will be the counter trends for you to get opportunity to buy the dips. They will be flushing out over leveraged traders. Most retail traders will get punished in those points because they'll be too big. They'll be trading too small a time frame. If you trade the big time frames and you know the main macro move, you know the direction the wind is blowing, you get the wind at your back and largely you are net long in that environment and you don't over focus and trying to call the tops, you will do rather well in the great long. That is my opinion. So they made the movie The Great Short. This is gonna be a much greater greater long and it's a long on all things that can't be proliferated they can't print gold silver and other things but those will be often the last to move um, you can't print oil that's being allowed to move more easily uh, and you can't supposedly uh, print crypto although there's a couple of caveats that have to be mentioned on that it's not perfect but Bitcoin is something that is meant to have a finite amount of distribution. Let's forget forks, which are, in my opinion, the equivalent of QE. We haven't had any forks in Bitcoin in a long, long time. And most of those forks are lagging substantially. In other words, they're not considered in the same light as the original. This is the uh, history of uh, Bitcoin taken from Bitstamp, which is one of the earliest um, exchanges and is one of the fastest growing asset classes. And most retail traders make money playing long. I say you're never a full, complete, full-time master of trading until you've made money on the short side more than once. Um, and it's one of the hardest things to do. But when you get it right, you get it damn right. We were short planes, all American pipelines uh, during that oil short. We were short oil. We were short tallow. We can take a look at those charts in another time. But it's crypto today. Um, all of those events occurred uh, and they fell 95 percent. However, the, most people will make their money long because the amount that you can make shorting is limited. If you short one million dollars, it has to go to zero for you to make a million dollars. Um, if it goes 50%, you make 500,000. If it doubles, you lose a million. So you've got to understand um, shorting is tough. Um, it's very, very profitable and happens exceedingly fast, however. So markets often go up on the escalator and they take the elevator down. Fast is very powerful. So when you learn to short and you get it right, it's exceedingly powerful. But that's not the topic. We're talking Bitcoin and here's Bitcoin's history. And this is on a log scale chart, by the way, just so that everybody understands that. That's how it looks uh, when you don't uh, put it on a log scale. It almost becomes meaningless. So whenever you're looking at long time frames on things that have had a hyperbolic tendency, which are being massive movers, log scale is the scaling you should be using. Um, so let's talk about crypto in the macro sense. Assuming some of you are um, first time, I think some of you will know. But for me, there is something called the halvening cycle where you have a bull market and then you have a subsequent bear market. And this has got to do with the supply of Bitcoin in the, the, the service. So Bitcoin is net, it is actually net proliferated, but the total proliferation is locked and capped at 21 million. I think 18, 19 million of it is already out. So the rate of proliferation is cut by half every four years. This has already happened uh, three times now. Um, and this is known as a halvening. You go check it all out. That's information you can get on Google. But this obviously has an effect on price because when supply is going to be reduced by 50%, um, there's going to be less for sale. There's less overhang and there's more people entering the space at a far more rapid rate than the supply is, um, is, is coming on board. In fact, the supply is contracting and eventually it will be capped out in total. So the network will be secured on transaction fees solely. So we've, we've, uh, our history kind of started with Bitcoin around about 16, 17. We were involved in the big bull run up and then the bear. This was one of our famous bear calls that upset a lot of people in crypto. In crypto is a lot of uh, the younger generation and in calling a short or a collapse is very unpopular opinion to have. Things must only go up. Uh, unfortunately, we're, not, we're less interested in that. And uh, we were famous for calling that. Everyone else was long calling a bottom. This is known uh, by us as an inverted HVF. That was a slap in the face event. And it was a bear market after a blow off top. You always end a trend typically in crypto, especially, but often in other markets too, with the final blow off. And you always start new bulls often with a final meltdown, which is why I keep asserting that the COVID-19 events was a trend changing event. We call the top in the debt markets um, and said that is the end for debt markets. That is a 40 year bull. My, my brother, a qualified actuary, worked in the UK industry with French Providence and many other companies as an investment bond um, trader. Uh, and portfolio manager uh, his entire career and he was net long his entire career bonds 
So he qualified in around about 81, 82, just post um, the Falker inflation, high interest rates, and he watched nothing but descending interest rates and increases in value. That is big cycles. People need to understand the big cycles if they want to be successful. Now, uh, COVID has changed that. The proliferation in debt has absolutely done incredible things. We can show you the bond market, but uh, we've got 45 minutes and I want to keep it crypto. So you're going to have to go have a look at that for yourself or you can follow us on our YouTube channels to see that coverage. Um, so big spill, big spill, final capitulation before a major run. That was $3,000 you met. And you might know that that actually is just under 65,000 since the run. So our overall view was a bear call there. We also called this as an echo bull. Everyone was going all time highs. The reason that was accurate is because uh, of a number of things. Candlestick charting, first of all, shooting stars, shooting stars, uh, cycle trading, cart analysis, and a lot of other things that we can maybe touch on today, but I don't know to what depth. Um, but there was also a flat bottomed, um, what some people traditionally would call a descending triangle. So let's just zoom this in so you get more of a view of the recent history. Um, and it's led to the eventual sell of uh, 3K. I'm going to show you an indicator and an asset we developed that we gave away free to the whole community in uh, crypto. We've only recently just released it um, in my modest sense. I called it the Hunt Bitcoin Cot Indicator. Um, and it's in my favorites. You can go find it if you find the crypto sniper on TradingView and you can grab the signal. Um, now, we're talking a lot about Bitcoin. Why Bitcoin? Because it's the dominant member of the market cap. So you're going to see a lot of Bitcoin. If Bitcoin sells off 55 percent, the rest dump. And they are normally higher beta, which means a higher risk. So they drop more. So Bitcoin lost 85 percent in that bear market and many uh, coins lost 95, 97 and more. Um, so here's an indicator that studies the commitment of traders. So this is what we contributed to the uh, crypto community. And we've actually just released it. The futures only really got started uh, round about here uh, during this inverted setup that we traded. We call that the inverted HVF, as I say, and we traded it short. So the data took a few months to settle down. So we started the indicator from this point once there was proper volume in the commitment of trader. Many of you might not know there's a future for Bitcoin, futures markets. Commitment of trader reports occur in silver, gold, and many other markets that can be got and have been got for decades. It's not new, it's not crypto specific thing. But the interesting thing about it, if I pull it up, is that um, it gives you the positioning of the largest four open longs and the largest four open shorts. This is what I call the insiders. That's why we call it the insider hunt BTC cot indicator. In other words, I get interested when big players are doing big things. That's basically the principle. Um, to get more detail, we'll give you, uh, you'd need to actually have a look at some of the stuff we put out on the YouTube. But essentially what we've done is we've looked at the largest four sellers, most of which will be miners. Remember, they are the net proliferators of the token. And uh, then people like Grayscale that have formed uh, a fund uh, that you can buy in if you want exposure, if you're an institution to the crypto markets. It doesn't yet have an ETF in America. It has one, I think, in Canada already. But Grayscale is the big fund provider where you can buy a share in their fund and you have Bitcoin uh, and there's also Ethereum uh, uh, exposure available for institutions. Um, so that's the way people end. They'll be big buyers, as an example. Now, what we noticed when we got the standard COT indicator up and hence why um, we've uh, done this. And this I'm pitching to people that are, are not keen on being overly regular traders and just want to investment trade maybe four key decisions um, in a year on crypto on the biggest coin without having to deep dive into all the other little um, guys that are out there. So I'll show you the standard Bitcoin CME data that you get. And it's going to get loaded in on the bottom of the screen there. You need to give it a second and it'll load. And that's what you get. Um, and if you hit the settings and you go, damn, what is that? You hit the settings, it'll explain to you. Institutional is the black line. So that will probably be the miners, the black line. The gray line is your professional trader. That'll be big traders. So that will be what is referred to as whales, um, significant, probably seven digit numbers. Uh, and then retail, lots and lots of rats and mice is the blue numbers, which is largely net long on that particular um, chart, if you're still seeing it. If you guys can confirm that the screen is still being shared, I hope uh, that's the case. But the, none of that was of interest to me. So I took them off. 
and we took him off and this was how we came to construct our indicator i just wanted the biggest guys in there the longs and the shorts so that's essentially what i got and what i noticed apart from once this early stage what i noticed is they separated and then every now and then they squeeze tight so when you had a tight squeeze you had a real bull market so if you watch with me those were very close. The sellers and the longs over there were very close. That was a great buy signal. When they got very far apart, the distance, we got sell signals. So I was watching for squeezes. There was another squeeze. That was a great buy signal, by the way. So even if you got right at the end on the Friday, the cot data comes out once a week. If you got right at the end and you traded to the upside, um, you would have got in at in and around the seven and a half levels. And by the time you topped out, you got a caution warning. Um, let's say, let's take the close, the low side of that candle. So we'll say you're sleeping a little bit and you're not executing particularly well on the downside. You would have got out at about 10,000. So that's that's around 33% uh, in a fairly short time frame, as you can see from the long. This actually provided also, very interestingly for me, um, the short signal, you're at your ultimate breadth apart with buyers. The buyers were at, the large buyers were at all time lows and not interested. And the sellers were at all time highs trying to sell over here. And all of this preceded the pandemic, as you can see. And Bitcoin fell from those giddy heights of around 10 and a half thousand to 3000. Imagine you were in that short. Boy, was that fun to enjoy uh, at that low. This is on Bitstamp, on other exchanges it fell lower. Um, and you can see that that was a very, very profitable short. Plus we have a cautionary when it starts to get a little bit wide that warned you right at the top. Next, you got the big long call over here. And we've recently, which is part of the excitement behind releasing the cot, uh, we started to get an accumulate uh, again over here. So you'll note we haven't had a sell. The last three signals have all been longs. This has a 100% record, by the way. It's not a 15 minute, a short time frame trade. This is for your investors. Disaccumulate here, which would have been that candle and the following candle, accumulate here. So you don't even have to have leverage. If you have $10,000, you would have bought and held. This is a super long. We get super longs and super shorts because of volatility based criteria that we also apply. This is very specific. You want to know more, you need to be in my community. You can just take the signals. Um, this is a long. If you put 10,000 in there, you would have been in at four and a half. No, my apologies, sub four one. And you would have been getting out at anywhere between this range, which at the low end of the range was around uh, 11,000. At the higher, the top of the wick, by the way, traded 14. So you could have got out anywhere there. That's pretty good signals, four signals a year. This is basically the 2019 year. Let's just highlight that. I'll take another color. This is the kind of analysis we're really interested in doing in my community. This is the focus. These are your years. There's the beginning of 2020. Uh, and this is the beginning of 2021. This is, in fact, the first signal for 2021. Here are your one, two. You actually only had three signals for 2020. And you had one. In fact, that one was on the cusp. Uh, no, no, my apologies, three signals, yes, uh, and a caution. So four, call it four signals. Uh, you had four signals in 19. These are all, every single one was a winning investment trade. So it's not to the five minutes. The data only comes out once a week. It's like looking at a weekly chart where you only get a price, one dot of data. Remember that. So you should be accumulating in the two, three days thereafter uh, or disaccumulating depending on the signal. So this is an example. Now I want to just show you something. So the lovely thing about crypto is Bitcoin is what I refer to as the God market, the God market. If it goes up, the others go up. Sometimes they will go up quicker. Sometimes Bitcoin is the leader, but it has a much higher market cap. Once again, if we just show you the market cap, Bitcoin's current market cap is $734,000. The next largest is Ethereum at 285, uh, which is significantly less. And you can see 62 billion 54 billion, 48 billion, et cetera, down on the other names. So Bitcoin is the boss. It's the bellwether. Understanding what Bitcoin does is probably your most important thing to successful crypto trading. Even if you don't intend to trade Bitcoin, you want to trade Ethereum. Just by the by, I'm going to leave that indicator on, which is Bitcoin's futures cot data. And I'm going to pull up the Ethereum chart and show you the same indicators again. Look at that long signal, 
Look at those two shorts smashing the top. Look at that long. Look at that caution and short there. And look at the long in there. Even better, actually, than the Bitcoin. Why? Because of correlation. And also, when you have a bull market that's a runaway bull market where the altcoins are participating, you get an even larger move up. You could have, without any form of leverage, and I did an Excel spreadsheet for this. Uh, I'm not sure I still have it close to uh, hand. I'll just check on my second screen. You could have accumulated Bitcoin value immensely just by following the trades involved here. This is kind of mathematical and technical, so I don't think I'm going to do this the whole way through, uh, but I'll just show you very quickly so you can see the net outcome. And it escalates very fast. Why? Because this is a volatile market, really strong volatile uh, market with substantial percentage moves. Hence why if you uh, use any form of leverage, you should be exceedingly careful and you absolutely should have stops. And you can expect if you're on too skittish a small token that doesn't have sufficient market cap to have slippage so that's why most of our focus is in the top 10 and understanding bitcoin is the main part of the job so you could have started being a buyer of bitcoin at 4000 you could have sold round about the earliest i took it at 98 that's quite generous of me to call it only 98 you should have sold at 10 plus and more but then you would have had a 36 bitcoin valuation so if you started with 40 grand um, which is not just the hugest amount of money, and you bought 10 Bitcoin down here at 4,075, you would already be well through the 3 million mark just by trading these signals, four trades a year. Tell me if that sounds interesting to you. If you're interested in making money and you're wondering why do people trade crypto, maybe this will lead to a couple, uh, a bit of insights, but very few people are trading it like this. Uh, again, no action on the second sell. I assume you sold everything on the other sell, so you didn't get the higher prices of the next candle. You then would have bought again uh, over there at around uh, with your new 20 Bitcoins valuation. At 7.3, it made 10.2 before you sold on the cautionary. You would then have $205,000 uh, in dollars. If you short on the super short, and most of these I assumed you didn't short, there was great money to be made in the short, but this actually is a super short. It's not showing as a super short at the moment um, because there's a slight amendment that I've done, um, but you would have uh, taken your Bitcoin from the 10K and jumped back in, in and around the four or 5,000. Let's assume you didn't get any of this uh, plummet, low orders you bought somewhere in here and you only paid uh, you ended up paying five seven fifty over here you didn't seize any of the opportunities on the smaller time frames if you did that you would have absolutely made another ninety thousand and you would have bought back that bitcoin you sold at uh, ten uh, thousand uh, for five so you would have ended up making an extra hundred grand on your 200 grand virtually and having that 50 percent more capital to buy the same bitcoin back that's now halved in price so you're getting multiple compounding effects in there and you end up with a 50 pound Bitcoin valuation, a 50 Bitcoin valuation. By the way, up at 65, uh, the all time high, the valuation of that is exceedingly, exceedingly high. 65 times that it's almost it's half of 6.5 million. It's 3.25 uh, million in uh, valuation on the 50 Bitcoin. I put 75 in there because on the super longs, we were actually, which this was, as I say, I've taken the super elements on some of these in some of these particular indicators were described super because we have a volatility based uh, indicator. This one was also one. I've removed it for part. That's why the only one there showing we suggested you use 50 percent leverage. That means if you had 10 Bitcoin, you purchase five others. That is not high leverage at all in that instance you would have had a position of 75 from here in bitcoin 50 of which you own 25 which you borrowed and you would have run up uh, to the 65k we then got a head and shoulders that we called we suggested everybody get in stable coins uh, the head and shoulders is over here so crypto trading is the game we on it all the time um, if i put this uh, on here we'll get some details and i'm going to drop the time frame because that's quite an unruly mess that some of you are wondering what's going on there. Um, that was the head and shoulders that then eventually uh, took place. We were warning that there was signs of fatigue in crypto because of this rising wedge. What happens to rising wedges? I think many of you know, um, you usually and often get uh, smash downs. And you can see this was the uh, rising wedge structures. So this kind of updating and trading is what we're busy with throughout this period in our uh, 
trading community, which has a lot of crypto, but also a lot of energy, gold, silver, and FX trading taking place. Boom, there were the rising wedges. We warn always marginally higher highs points to exhaustion. Why does it do that? Because support and resistance traders are the most obvious traders and they typically get punished. So had with that being the previous high, you are waiting, you're staying just below and then you run it there. Everybody charges in long, they get given a small profit and then they get a washout right the way down there and they get stopped out. Then you go, oh, look, we made a new high. Let's try again. Maybe we were just unlucky. Marginally higher high again everybody support and resistance trader that's not not to say i don't uh, see value in support and resistance in concept i don't see value in it as a trading concept when you are getting marginally higher highs they chase in long they get washed out and they end up right down there they stopped out many times earlier before that eventual low in the end you'd see that there's a left shoulder uh the big rising wedge kind of head and then we both visited this 47 500 which was a head and shoulder structure we scrambled and clung to get in there nice falling wedge in there to jump in and then we got on top of this level so lots of validation for the 47 500 this was a rising wedge to squeeze up onto it and over it um and then you could see this head dunk came all the way down to the 47,500 and you went and you got a second chance to get out still at good values. All you had to do is recognize that this was probably a right shouldering event and that there was real fatigue here and you were starting to get some smackdowns. There was also continuation trades on the short side to be taken over here as well. That was a rising wedge, you break and even still you get a second chance. The return move, which is typical with uh, rising wedges, bang, smash down and then you are over here. So this is the recent history of Bitcoin where you might have met a few crypto friends that are licking their wounds. They would have been washed out and would have been holding Bitcoin and they would have had a 55% drawdown to 30K from 64.8, which is almost uh, 65,000, a 55% drawdown. That is huge. Now, um, you'll see the macro indicator and you'll say, well, that's not a very good entry. It's a weekly data point, which is a point that should be acted on on the rolling three uh, to seven days as an accumulate along the lows option, just as it's not an immediate panic sell everything or panic buy anything because it's macro data for the relative low periods. So I just highlight that as well because people can often misconstrue. So my overall opinion is that this is now an accumulation zone for crypto. It's an accumulation zone for crypto. But the reason I started with fiat is there's something important to bear in mind here. We are now, crypto, when it ran up to 65K, had the dollar literally dying a thousand deaths. It fell all the way to barely uh, 89 um, on the Dixie index. We had a tailwind for that massive continuation pattern that I was showing you. We're now in an accumulation box, a little bit on the high end. You've just had a bit of Dow theory. Um, play out over here with a bull. Uh, let's get out of squares uh, and go back to lines. Uh, a bull flag that I've drawn in blue for you that you could have taken. Quite traditional. The technical analysis stays the same. It's people. It's always people. Technical analysis is actually about people, the way that they respond to price and when they have leverage. It's the same. It doesn't change. You don't get crypto patterns that are uniquely crypto. Um, some people will say the bot pattern, the bot pattern, which is a cranky little bit of bot buying um, skirmishing. But generally, it's simple TA as you would. Now, that high hasn't been made, but you made the periphery of all these relative highs that occurred here. Um, and hence why you're getting a little bit of backward churn back into range. The other thing that's happening is the dollar is being strong. And the point I started with the dollar is that is a stable coin based on the dollar. You can do a pure dollar, BTC, USD, but USD Tether is a token that is essentially designed to mimic the performance of the dollar. So why, uh, why did we have such a powerful move from the 10K, which would have run you up to millions of uh, net worth? in the short, such a short time period, because we also had the proliferation and the weakness of the dollar. And we had this chart as uh, a very unique. So here's what I'm saying about crypto. Here's why I'm engaged with crypto. If you aren't already engaged, here's why you should consider it. The key thing is the technical analysis is the same. 
The next thing is fundamentally we are transitioning from a failed financial system to something else that's going to involve the blockchain and they need value. They need new value for all the value that's going to be deflated away in the fiat world and the banking system that's going to have a parallel system of equal scale. So we're trying to fit Jupiter with all the quadrillions of derivatives into a beach ball in the corner of my room down there. So the beach ball has to get blown up a little bit and Jupiter has to get chunked down a little bit. It's a heck of a job. You can trade that on a net long basis. You're going to be exceedingly well positioned if you do that. This has been nothing but an expansionary market the whole way through. Of course, it's had bear markets and its bear markets are brutal because it's a high volatility. People say bear market, 85%, that's decimation. Yeah, Bitcoin all the way up to $65,000 has had 70%, 55% decimations. That is because of the high beta uh, that it currently has. Guess what's happening? The beta is reducing, the volatility is reducing slowly. It's still going to be way more volatile than an FX currency, way more volatile than this, the silver market. But uh, it's coming down. As it gets bigger, it's harder to move at 30% and drop at 30%. More people have seen the movie before. More institutional money will buy bottoms and lows uh, on a never-ending basis. More corporations. Family office are coming in. I'm not here to be a cheerleader for it. I don't think it's freedom money. I think it's probably owned by the same people that own the other system. They're never going to let you have your own money. But that doesn't mean I don't want to profit out of trading this massive transitional event, which could be life-changing wealth building for you. That is why you should be in the crypto markets. Plus, the, the single biggest ever technical pattern, which is a huge symmetrical triangle, which in terms of crypto's years of life, is a 2.5 year symmetrical triangle. If you're a traditional technical analyst, we call it the first cup gold nugget HVF setup. We had targets for it. And it is the reason why you had such a perfect magic carpet ride up through our target all the way to this top. In fact, you passed our targets. We're into overperformance zone, and that's why you start to get more volatility and some sell-offs. But overall, we expect further overperformance. It's just going to be more choppy. It was absolute magic carpet. It was money for old uh, rope uh, riding the upside. You have never had a continuation pattern that's taken that long. This was the December of 2017 highs. Officially, you could argue that you only broke in uh, August, September of 2020. That is 17 to 2020. This asset has only existed for 11 years. 10, 11 depending in a serious way. So you're talking about 2.5 years out of 11 years. You're talking about 22% of its entire life. It's been in a setup continuation. This will produce further overperformance. We will come back in four years time and I will be doing a crypto update and you'll be somewhere in here is my longer term view on this chart. Could I be wrong? Could they cancel and make it illegal? Of course. Could it go to zero? It's possible. Do I think it's likely? No. Too much institutional money is now involved. Uh, the game has got too big um, uh, for most of the, 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 the people to actually spoil it. If they wanted to kill it, they would have done it already when they were talking about um, pedophiles and AK-47s and assassins and all that uh, skullduggery. We all know it's the secret services that do that. They've been doing it on the dark web and they have all their own payment methods for doing that long before Bitcoin or crypto existed. Um, so you're in one of the biggest continuation patterns breaks that has occurred that should deliver overperformance on an epic scale. That means inflation and retail traders make their most money on highly strong ascending going up markets. So that's why, again, you should be in crypto, learning how to make payments and do wallet management because it's all coming anyway. It's all coming anyway. The central banks want to release their own versions uh, of it. Of course, they all have the license to proliferate like gangbusters because that's what they did before. But they can hit the reset button. Funny, our logo includes the reset sniper, the crypto sniper, and the market sniper, and we've had it for over 12 years. Now Klaus has come and stealing our name, and he's talking about uh, a global reset. Careful. They're telling you where they're taking you. So are you positioning for that yet, or are you going to wait for the lightning to strike? Well, uh, I'm not waiting for my fiat to become uh, valueless. Uh, I can deal with the volatility. 
you can invest you don't have to be leverage trading involved in this game and you can do exceedingly well and i've just shown you one single indicator for which you need to do nothing else and you could have had a huge huge multiple the fact that the last three signals on the cot which is showing the insiders are not interested in being huge net sellers yet uh, shows me that we are still in a macro bull and this pullback when you look at log scale is not so devastating despite it being 55 percent that illustrates to me that in actual fact we are uh, we've got more to come and this is halftime oranges halftime oranges football match you go in they've just uh, you were three nil up you, you conceded a goal just before halftime you come and get your rest and you get ready for the other half and you go out and score some more that is my view right now macro bull and we've just had the signal that we've had. If you want to learn more about this, by the way, I think my time is not uh, inevitably uh, available to me. So let me just give you a few keys. You're welcome to come and learn how to trade further with us across Bitcoin. By the way, the other tokens, when it's bullish, go up even faster. We've made calls on Ethereum relative to Bitcoin, and we've pivoted out of Bitcoin for select moments. So there are plenty of opportunities to build your Bitcoin wealth, your Ethereum wealth, and I also measure my wealth in silver and gold ounces and I think you should do too. Why? Because everything you currently measure it in is being proliferated away in a highly inflationary environment. Whilst there will be deflationary shocks, your money is a greased pole. You are a monkey climbing a greased pole. If you don't recognize that, you want to work and toil and never get anywhere, feel free. If you decide to be part of the new revolution and all that goes with it, and I don't evangelize about it, this is the place to start learning. And I'm an Born in the wood, equity trader first, commodity trader, FX trader. But the fundamentals tell me here is where the new uh, financial system will be born. I'm the market sniper.com if you want to get more details. I'm on Twitter under the market sniper and the crypto sniper. I hope I've done enough in just that 45 minutes to get you a little bit excited in, in, and interested in getting engaged uh, with it. Be careful. High volatility instruments can hurt you. Leverage and high leverage is being handed out to people because they know you can get hurt. It's an unregulated environment. There are lots of hazards uh, in there. Part of that is what I like, but at the same time for other people, it doesn't suit. Don't ask for government to come and save you. Own your own trading outcomes in all that you do. Do they have any questions for me to field? What's a realistic monthly target in potential terms? I can't answer that. Um, you, I can show you what's happened historically. I have no, I can't tell somebody a number. It, it, it's just impossible. Um, but imagine you have to replace the current financial system that they're getting a bit impatient and they're really wanting to push their reset button on debt uh, and fiat uh, and wonder how fast and quickly this might have to expand to accommodate that. That's my best. And then put a number to that. Your, your guess will be as good as mine. Um, any other questions that I can see that folk would like me to answer? TheMarketSniper.com. Thank you. We're also on YouTube under the Crypto Sniper for the Crypto. We do a lot on the traditional markets on oil, gold, silver, uh, and FX. Simon, are there any other folks that I can help with questions? I don't think so. Um, Francis, thank you very much in, indeed um, for that. We've got our next speaker um, waiting patiently in the room. So. Uh, I think we'll say thank you very much. There's I see there seems to there have been technical sniper. problems. I don't know how much you got. Um, I, I got everything, actually. Um, I think we're, we were, we're pretty much okay. What time frame do you um, use? Best to use the macro if you're an investor. Four hours daily. Um, plenty of gains that can be achieved uh, on that. Um, and... Uh, yes, uh, you, that, those are the best things. If you're looking for action, you can always drop time frames, but you've got to be careful and recognize where the big economic system and game is coming. Larry enjoyed it. Hey, great to see you, Larry. Welcome. Um, you're taking over from me, I'm sure. Nice, Wayne. Thank you. Glad to have helped. I think I'm done. Do I have to surrender the uh, mic or anything, Simon, or is that all down to you? Um I think uh, if you just turn your mic and your video off, I, I, I can take over from, from here. I can see Simon. Thank I you don't, very much. I'm not sure if you can even hear me. Uh, so let me have a look if I have to hit anything. Can you hear me, Simon? Yes, I'm, I'm hearing you fine. Is everybody else no, hearing me at all? Your, your audio is gone, Simon. Um, let me see if I can okay. gracefully surrender and depart um, without Simon. 
I uh, prefer the go-to meeting, I would say, Simon. I think uh, you've got a couple of gremlins in here today with this new app. Yeah. Stop sharing. That's something to do. And maybe I should just exit and that will hand it back. I'm not sure what will happen. Okay, yeah. Here we go. Sharing. Okay, thanks for being with me. I think everybody can um, appreciate we're having just a few uh, niggles here. I'm bringing Jamie sadly into the the webinar now, however, so we should be able to move on. This this swapping over um, from one speed to the next is a little bit more tricky than uh, than it was on the last system. So um, we're we're getting there though. We're getting there. Thanks for sticking with us. Um, Great, Larry's still here as well. Larry's on. We're we're going over to Jamie Sattley first. Um, we've crossed the sea. We're 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 into Missouri, St. Louis, and um, nobody can hear me. Um, okay, just checking now. Okay, so does anybody hear me first of all? If you let me give me a yes um, in the chat box, that would be good. Clicking again to invite Jamie for a second time. It's the system's just not quite as good. Oh, Jamie, great! You can hear me. <laughs> and reinviting you. Um, we're going to get there. We're going to get there. Great. Okay, everybody seems to still be here, which which is good. Uh, Francis was just saying he couldn't hear me, so let's just give okay, the system uh, a second or two, and I can see it loading up. Um, there we go. Wonderful, Jamie. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Fi I'm fine. I'm, I'm well. I'm not that fine. I'm struggling with a new platform that we're using, and it's not quite as slick as the. The old one does have some new features, but uh, it's not quite as robust as the the go to webinar one that we've been using previously. Anyway, we are here and it's working. It's good to see you. You um, too. My first of all, apologies for getting you up at the um, silly o'clock in the morning um, by giving you the wrong times. Um, I think I made a uh, mix up with, with Larry I'm, as well. I'm, I'm awake anyway, so don't worry about yeah. it. <laughs> good. good to have you here, um, Jamie Sattley from sbtradedesk.com and of course Chief Market Strategist at Scandinavian Capital Markets. That's how we met last year, in fact. That's right. Um, we did some events together, which was great. And uh, yeah, I'm just really pleased to, to invite you back. I just sort of sent a quick message to you. Would you fancy joining us just to give us a, a sort of an overview of the markets um, using the, the technical charts and indicators that you do? So. Uh, I was really pleased when you came back to, to agree to do that. Um, let's first of all get across to your screen. If you hover above your sort yeah, of webcam I, picture. I think I did something. Can, can you see a chart now? You've done it already. That's great. Yes, we should be looking at that chart. So let's make that the main um, picture. If everybody is just confirms to me that you can see Jamie's chart at the moment. It's a black price. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so I, yeah, I, fi I figured that uh, I was wondering where I'd start, but I might as well follow up uh, on the last presentation. So I'm going to start with Bitcoin here, and okay. we're going to go through a very, like, kind of a very broad, uh, you know, ten thousand foot view here of of Bitcoin, and you're going to see a channel that starts back with 2015. Okay, and um, you know, one of, one of the main ways I look at markets is through the prism of, of angles, which means channels and trend lines. And in this case, we've got a channel going back to 2015, okay? And we're extending it from this 2013 high. That same angle, you can see, touches the low back here, touches the high here. 
but pay attention to the midpoints between that center line. Okay. Now that center line, you can see where we stopped on this latest decline, right? But what you're seeing here is that the market Bitcoin is actually trading from this, what I call the 25 line, which is halfway between the lower channel line and the midpoint and the 75 line, which is halfway between the midpoint and the upper channel line. So this is what we call symmetry in markets. Um, the market based and based and based for years took off from that 25 line and guess where we went? The 75 line. Uh, we were writing about this for a while and we were once we broke this back in uh, December of 2020, we were looking for us to get up to this level. Now we were up there and we, you know, put in a big top. I'm going to stick with this, uh, call it a call, if you will, but that we're going to go back to at some point, the 25 line. That happens to intersect that old high from December 2017 near 20,000. So you know, aside from any sort of philosophical thing you may feel about Bitcoin or crypto or what have you, we are looking for just a price chart trading symmetrically between the 25 and the 75 line. Can you guys still hear me, by the way? Are we still good? Okay. I just, for some reason, my it feels, it felt like my microphone, uh, microphone went off. So starting with Bitcoin, that's what we're looking at. Uh, or that's what I'm thinking. And if I zoom in, let's even go to like a four hour chart, all right? Those of you that follow Elliot or are familiar with Elliot Wave at all, we've got a five down from the top, one, two, three, triangle, four, five. And so far we've got three up. Now, here's something very interesting as far as Bitcoin is concerned. We're gonna go to a different chart. The retrace, Bitcoin has a tendency after it crashes off the top to retrace 38.2% and then resume its decline. That 38.2 is going to be about 44,000. We almost got there two days ago. Um, not saying we don't get there or we do get there. We could chop around for a while. In fact, we probably do after the emotional market that we had. Markets tend to have to you know, digest for a while. But look what happened after we crashed off the top back in 2017, retrace to the 38.2. Back in 2013, retrace to the 38.2. Also, follow that 200 day average. It's actually, it's kind of ridiculous actually how, how great the 200 day average works on Bitcoin, something that simple. I like to say there's a uh, elegance in simplicity, but you can see here 2013 or 2017 off the top, 200 day average. Here we are again. Let's get to that 200 day average. So, you know, just looking at it from a very simple point of view, uh, get rid of Elliott, get rid of median lines, get rid of channels, 38 two retraces after you crash from the top. And that's your decision point, as I like to, as I like to call it. So 44,000 or so, and then I'm looking lower. Okay. Larry says, please stop telling him about 38.2. Well, hey, Larry, I say that I didn't, I, I'm not telling him about 38.2. The market is, tell, is telling him about 38.2, right? When we get a good channel or a good trend line, I didn't draw it. The market drew it. All right, let's, uh, before we go to FX stuff, let's look at a couple other macro things because a lot of these, everything is kind of tied in together, right? Um, if you look back at uh, March 2020 and the massive lows that we had in pretty much everything, uh, one of the things that I follow the closest actually is lumber. And that was the first market to, I think it's down here. That was the first market to really take off and go to all time highs. So here is a uh, life of chart or life of asset lumber chart, okay? Look at this median line, pitchfork, 1974 low, back to the high, I should actually fix this because that is ridiculous, there we go. Tick, 
take out this upper parallel and crashing. So looking at uh, lumber now, parallel, I'm looking at lumber right here, about 865 is where we should see it bounce. Um, and you can see the parallel here, the angle, I just put a sliding parallel as we call it, off of this top here. That's where we topped initially, right? In August 20, this is the low in March of 2020, which by the way, was on this parallel. Tanked, resistance again, broke through, support. I'd say that's a pretty big level. So I'm looking at these levels, have alerts set, because that's where, again, I like to look at markets as far as uh, I call them. I don't know where things are going. I just know that it's like a train station. We go to one stop, then it decides where, the, where it's going to go. It's a decision point, right? Copper is very similar. Went to an all-time high. By the way, trend line all the way back to 2001. Broke through it. Daily chart, just two days ago, we had the big break in copper. Broke that trend line from March 2020. First level is 23.6. See, Larry, I'm not talking about 38.2 now. Now we're going. Now we're going 23.6. That is actually the first fib, fib retracement that I'll pay attention to is 23.6, and it happens to intersect with former resistance from March of this year. So we could get there. You know, the way things are going this week, we could get there today or tomorrow, uh, and that could be again not saying that this is where we go and then we bounce. I'm saying that's where I want to pay attention. Everything between here, the break and there, I don't care. I just want to know when we get there. Uh, let's look at, again, these are all tied together. If I overlay this, if I overlay equities, Aussie dollar, Bitcoin, whatever, for the most part, it's all been a big reflationary trade. You probably heard that term a million times over the last year or so. Let's look at uh, 30 year yield. Thirty-year yield channel all the way back to 1987. Channel. This is another uh, called a method. Extend the channel, the width of the channel. That's exactly where we bottomed again in March 2020. Came back to the center line, and since then we've pulled back. So when I'm thinking about this from a you know a macro point of view. My view or my thought process is that we have put in some sort of a top. I don't know how we get down here, but I'm thinking until we break this, that we do get back down here. That's the next level, right? That was the level that we had resistance after the low in March 2020, several times. We broke through it. We went to the next level. I'm looking for us to come back to the level, right? Former support, turn resistance. It's true, not just in horizontal levels, but also in trend lines channel lines, median lines, what have you. So with all that said, we will go to the dollar. I'm going to start actually with an index some of you may not follow. It's um, the Dow Jones FXCM dollar index, and it's just four currencies, uh, euro, pound, yen, and Aussie, divided by four, whereas DXY is extremely weighted towards, obviously, euro and Europe in general. And the level that we hit right here, right, actually all the way back in January, and we've been basing. If you've been reading any of my, any of my stuff over the last six months um, or watching webinars, and I do webinars on Fridays, um, we've been talking about this. And frankly, it's gotten kind of boring because we've been saying the same thing over, over and over. Um, but we've held this view that this is a bigger base, and we're going to work higher from this level. And... You know, we've got a very well-defined level up here with the 200-week average, 38.2 retracement, and simply horizontal level. If I were to look at this from an Elliott standpoint, we got one, two, three, four, five, former fourth wave high. So that to me is kind of what I call a magnet uh, because there's just so much there, so well-defined. And it's not just the level. Um, I'm going to bring up a couple of headlines. One of my favorite things to do when it comes to uh, sentiment analysis, every day I will just go to Google News, type in US dollar, right? And see what's there. In fact, we'll do it in a second. But this is, all right. So these are some of the um, headlines that came out. Look at May 11th, okay? 
So where were we on May 11th? May 11th was right here, right? Status is reserve currency in jeopardy, blah, blah, blah. Okay, fine. One cent at a time. This one is the decline of the US dollar. It's not the point that these are like wrong. It's the point that these are the ones that are getting the most readership. So when they're getting the most readership, they, it means they're popular. By definition, it means that, you know, the boat is a little too full and markets have a way of um, correcting that imbalance, if you will, by going the opposite direction. Now, these were some of the best ones. Let's see. The demise of the dollar. This was Financial Times, um, kind of the more widespread or popular the publication periodical, uh, the more important the signal. Everyone talks about the magazine indicator, for example. Um, these would be, you know, kind of like one degree less than that. Um, but demise of the dollar, obviously pretty bearish. And this is my favorite one. Bitcoin and the death of the US dollar. Bitcoin Magazine, never heard of it. But when you have imagery like this, uh, like on fire, um, that connotes extreme bearishness. And this was on May 24th, which would have been right, literally right there. So just about the best possible time to buy the US dollar. So let's do this little exercise. Let's do this now. Let's type in US dollar. Let's see what we get. We'll go to news. Okay. We'll probably ask that ton dollar. Dollar edges up. Dollar keeps climbing. Dollar jumps. So, like, there's nothing here that says, you know, dollar, um, king dollar or something. You know, when you start seeing articles with king dollar, it means you're near a top. We don't have that yet. Now, I did this earlier and because the uh, euro, when you type in euro at this time, all you get is soccer stuff or football, I should say. So yeah, it's not going to work for euro right now. So pay attention to that um, when it comes to sentiment. Once you start seeing predictions about, you know, the dollar is going to get stronger um predictions are the best because it means that people are extremely comfortable in what they are, are writing or saying and that again by definition is a sentiment extreme so where might we stop on this little rally so we are at the center channel line from here so this is a level to pay attention to literally right now um and you can see if you just put a horizontal line on it you do have some levels, right? High here, high here, close to the low. So we're at a zone that I would be paying attention to. But again, this would be just a minor pullback in my opinion, as far as the dollar is concerned. You gotta remember, we are coming from a huge level. If we look at DXY, let's look at this one a little cleaner. Huge level, right? 2009 high base in 2018. And here we are since December of last year. Um, I'm sure some of you have, you know, heard dollar sec, uh, Swedish Krona is a good one to kind of follow in terms of um, kind of a leading indicator for the dollar. That hit gigantic support. This is something just simple, like a channel like this. Again, 2008 low, 2011 low, channel, nailed that top, March of 2020. And guess what? We came right back to the center line, channel line, and we've seen this before. This level provide massive support, right? So this has been one of the main reasons that I've been thinking the dollar is hit you know, hitting a huge uh, inflection point. And it's taken a while, right? We've chopped back and forth and made everybody uh, kind of trigger happy and dollar rips, everyone gets bullish, tanks, everyone gets bearish. 
now I do think we are seeing a bit uh, more of a sustained move. Dollar Chinese yuan. This is a very big one too. Again, just a simple channel back to 2014, 2018. I have this highlighted. This is actually one of the charts from last night. And you can see that we've got what appears to be a, uh, a false break or a failed breakdown, right? Failed breaks tend to go pretty quick in the opposite direction. And I'm thinking that's what we're getting here, All right? So, you know, just because it's, uh, you might not be trading Chinese yuan, you might not be trading dollar Swedish Krona, but they are very good indicators in terms of general dollar direction. And, you know, don't take my word for it. Let's just throw up, let's say DXY, right? DXY in orange. There you go. So let's move to Euro. All right, so I'm gonna focus on the move from March of last year, okay? Uh, again, just a simple channel. And look what happened at the center line here. That, if you can see it, sorry if I'm moving this around so much, but you can see how that was support. Again, support turned into resistance. We've broken down. So my focus is on this lower parallel. The upper parallel has been resistance. The center line has been important, especially in uh, you know this year since February is again support and then resistance. That lower level is going to be about 1850, which again has also been a level. Uh, you know, just looking across the chart to the left, right? Support in early March, resistance here in October of last year. Jamie, yes. Can I ask you? I know this. I won't be the only one. Lots of people will be wondering this, but always just a bit too shy to ask. But it's a, it, it, it's like the Fibonacci levels. Can you just explain how you come to setting that support and resistance, the channel that, or, or the pitchfork, is it that you describe it as? Where you, where you plot it? On sure. The chart. Thanks. Absolutely. So the main um, the main thing to do is what you're doing is you're looking for the angle that the market's trading on. And a lot of time it's what I call original slope. And actually the long term Australian dollar chart is a great example of this. So a lot of people, if you just saw this chart, right, mm -hmm. let's go to yeah. a, mon a monthly chart. If you saw this chart you'd probably draw a trend line like that, right? Yeah. Well, the original slope is actually the first two levels. It's actually that one. So that's what we're looking for. The original slope, the first two pivots kind of set that level. Okay. Uh, or set, sets the angle. So that's, that's how I start. After that, what you're doing is you're looking for, um, You're looking for mark or levels that the market is is trading on if it's not trading on original slope but usually it does here's another one right dollar sec which we looked at before it's the first two major lows we could do this on a very short-term basis as well um you know if we looked at say i don't know let's go to a short-term chart let's just look at let's just go to a euro like hourly chart and see if we can find something in interesting So here would be a setup on the Euro hourly chart. Actually, we're, we're going to go to DXY. Okay. So the first two lows in this base, right, is back here on May 25th and right here on June 1st. So that is the angle that we're looking to trade on. Okay. We're going to take parallels. We're going to make the channel. Resistance. Now this was yesterday, right? That was Fed. Now a perfect setup, so to speak, 
what you would do is you would have what I call the slingshot setup where you would break through, then you would come back and it would be support because it used to be resistance, right? That obviously didn't happen, right. but it still could. So I, I like, you know, I wouldn't uh, dismiss this as a possible support level. Dollar CAD was similar, I believe. See the original channel here, broke through off the races. This would be a level I would pay attention to if you came back to it. Mm -hmm. So to answer your question, I guess it's um, paying attention to the first two, the first two lows kind of, or, or highs, if the downtrend set what I call the, the slope for the move. Thank and you very much. Yeah, sets the sets the angle. Now the the thing is is how you confirm that because it, it seems quite arbitrary. Um, you set you know once you go to the center line of that channel, that's when it becomes what I call operable. So right now for this U.S. dollar index chart, it just became operable or confirmed because we can draw it off these two lows, and we just hit that center line. So now this is in play, right? And the focus would be up here. There's several things that can happen here. Um, obviously, you know, you can pull back sharply. You can oscillate around it. But the key is for me, as far as what I'm looking to do here would be move above it and then have it provide support. And I can, you know, go back in time and just kind of give some examples if that helps. So let's go back to say when we had early uh, 2011 when the big bull move started, right? Mm -hmm. So probably we would not okay. use go the, back. Sorry, you use the bottom and then the the high, but not the. So what you're doing is you're just you're just drawing a channel. So like let's say again at this point we didn't know any of this, right? All we had was right was right here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So if we look at this, this was ended up being operable once we hit it, and then we went to the upper channel level. Once we broke through it, then we look for our channel extension target did not quite get there but you're trying to trade within these within these uh within these channels within these lines and the thing about it is you don't know where it's going but you're trading around the what i call trading around the edges so you're getting very high reward to risk uh situations or most importantly you're getting very low risk situations because you're trying to kind of buy or sell you know and knowing if you're wrong right away right if that yeah. if that makes if that makes any sense yeah it does uh yeah. So like this is right now is a perfect example. You know, here we are. We could stop right here and oscillate and, you know, mm. just, you know, can oscillate, pull back sharply. I don't think we will. I think we'll probably, you know, digest, go through it and then pull back. And then you want this to be support. So that's a little, uh, I guess, median line uh, example uh, of setups that I like to look for. Um, we did look at, at Aussie. So here's that Aussie chart again with that original slope. And as it is right now, the level that I'm looking for us to get to is going to be one of the most defined levels I've ever seen in my life. So you see that high 74.14. I'm going to bring in the third or 23.6 retrace, which is also 74.15. And we're going to go two equal legs from the high, which is also 74.15. So that, again, is what I call a magnet. And we could even throw the channel on there. And guess what? It's also right here. So this is another good example. Uh, let's even go to a four hour chart. So we hit that center line here that was on June 3rd. So that means it was confirmed, right? 
Now we broke it today. If at some point over the next few days, we'll probably take out this low, right? And then we get a bounce and then this becomes resistance because it used to be support. This is actually a great example. All right, so come here, then you're looking to sell back at the center line because again, it was support. And Wayne says, then you wait for the slingshot. Right, so the slingshot would be if we traded down through the bottom of the channel and then you came back to that channel from the underside and that would become resistance. That's exactly right. Kiwi, here's a crazy long-term Kiwi chart. So look at this pitchfork all the way back to 85. Where did we top? Right there, right on it. Doesn't always work out like that, obviously, but um, very interesting study in these in these pitch force. I mean, frankly, it's just a huge level. I mean, look at this. All right, now we are looking at long-term charts, so this is not gonna be extremely precise. We're looking at huge zones here. Um, dollar CAD. Is one here, and I'm wondering if there's a Elliot people in here. I'm wondering what people think about this. If I just look at it from this is a monthly chart now, but like if this is a one, two, three, four, five, or if all of this is four, one, two, three, four, which means we have another huge rally in store. Frankly, I don't care so much. Um, I just know that this is huge support. And I'm probably looking up towards this level about, you know, let's call it 130-ish, right? And then we'll see what happens. Again, think about it as a uh, going from decision point to decision point. Uh, Wayne has a comment here. Where would your stops be? Um, sorry, take profits, break even. Look, everyone's going to have a different way of doing it. Um, one, a simple way to play stops is, you know, kind of take a percentage of the range. So like, you know, for me, if I'm trading on a you know bigger swing basis, you might want to take a percentage of the weekly range, the average weekly range. Um, if you're a very short term trader, you might want to take a small percentage of the daily range, but that's going to obviously depend on your time frame. Uh, TLT, which is just the bond ETF. This is actually another good example of using median lines. So here we have the channel. And again, trading between the 25 line and the 75 line, we hit the median line, we came back, we hit the median line, we broke through. If we do pull back, which again would mean rising rates, then this should be support. Mm -mm -mm. Yen crosses are extremely interesting right now as well. So Aussie Yen, we actually triggered a short on this today. Um, Broke this line yesterday, right here, entry at the underside of the line, and here we go, right? As far as where the target is on this, I'm thinking right here, you see this line? Uh, it's essentially a massive head and shoulders, right? Neckline here. It was once support for liftoff. It might be again, and it also intersects with these old highs. So let's call it 81. So that's going to be a huge level to pay attention to. Euro yen. 
also making a very big move today. We have a huge wedge from last October and we just broke that. So this is actually an actionable idea right now. Um, the underside of this blue line here is gonna be, let's call it 132.30s. That is now resistance. Simple, you know, short entry, stop above today's high. Frankly, we could come all the way back here. Again, the it's you know it sounds crazy, um, but you know these markets kind of crawl higher, and then you know it's elevator up or stairs up, elevator down, right? So, what do you think is going to happen throughout the summer, Jamie? I mean, I know we're, we're looking at the charts and we're, we're we're seeing what's actually happening now, but do you have a view? I mean, the world's sort of crawling out of the emergency panic session of uh, right. the, the pandemic. Well, all right, we had, I wrote this the other day, but we had, if you looked at, say, um, let me see if I can, hold on, let's see if I can find this. some reason when I go to my own website my face pops up there I think it's a some sort of a, a bug because that's kind of ridiculous but um, where was it it was here all right so we had first we had that big break in Bitcoin right then we had the big break in copper now we're getting the big break in uh, dollar in the opposite direction so here we have S&P, Aussie, and copper, right? Essentially over the last, you know, almost two years. I know at times they don't feel like they're totally correlated, but the dollar is telling you something right here. I feel like, you know, equities are always the last to know. So saying what's going to happen over the summer, I feel like we're probably in for a pretty good break to the downside. And you're seeing that right now uh, with, you know, risk sentiment as far as, As far as Aussie yen is concerned, Aussie, Bitcoin, uh, you know, yields, uh, S&P right now is testing this little tiny trend line. Um, but you've got, you know, a widening uh, wedge here. It's called like an ending diagonal, whatever you want to call it, kind of the jaws of death. So to answer your question, Simon, I'm looking at, again, thinking about this indecision points, either we get another pop and we go to this line. I don't think we do, uh, given all of the intermarket analysis and, you know, again, all the breakdowns that we're seeing across risk assets. But the big level is down here, which is going to be like, let's call it 3960, uh, right? Because that, if you break that, then you break this entire structure. Um, so that's kind of my view when it comes to uh, S&P and um you know, I guess risk sentiment in general, but we're all, we're already seeing those breakdowns across uh, a host of assets, right? So equities, as I always say, are always the last to know uh, for whatever reason. They get held up the longest and then it's very quick. Thanks, Jimmy. Sorry, I'm just talking oh, no worries. the mic here. While we've got Jimmy here, does anybody have any specific um, queries or markets that we want to maybe get them to look at? Um, give us your thoughts on will you anybody got other ideas on the dollar or the pound or anything in particular? It'd be interesting to hear. Oh, the, the we actually the pound is one that we actually didn't look at. So. We're actually coming up on a really big spot um, for the pound. And sorry, this is a little messy, but if you look at this 2007, 2014 line, right? We zoom into it. We spiked up through there in February. It was resistance, resistance. We went back through it. We're getting very close. So that's going to be like 3870. Um, for me, that's kind of, that's a key level to pay attention to. You know, if the 
forget about you know generalizing it with you know dollar up or down against everything but like if something interesting or, or shocking is going to happen with cable on the upside i think it needs to hold this level right here so you know it's like 120 pips away we're pretty close So that would be what I'm looking at with uh, pound against dollar. Pound yen is a good one. We can draw this fork all the way back to 2016. And guess what? That center line has proved to be, you know, again, another inflection point, if you will. And this is a good example of finding parallels. So. I always do everything on log scale, so if you do the angles, but if we do there 15 degrees and then put a 15 degrees here, mm -hmm. this would be a level that I would be paying attention to. So it happens to intersect with this high. And again, these, you know, this is not saying like, this is what's gonna happen and this is, you know, it's going here and then here. These are just levels that you want to pay attention to. And if you start trading on those angles, it starts to give you confidence that you're trading, you know, you're in harmony with the market, if that makes any sense. So, so this, is a, this is a good example of the median line being a stopping point here, right? And we're using, we're on trading view at the moment, aren't we? This is the platform yeah. just for this. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Trading view, it's a great, uh, it's, it's a great, it's a great platform. Um, you know, web based, you can do it from anywhere. Doesn't take up too much of your computer. Well, that's it. Everything's changing. What about all these Robin Hoods and Reddits and all this, the way these forums are changing the markets and manipulating the markets what do you think about that is that uh, a fad i mean that... yeah i mean i don't know I, it's it seems kind of like a speculative excess um if you will i don't you know i again you know i don't pay so much attention to uh the individual equities per se but from a sentiment standpoint you know everyone's sitting around and and you know and just trading you know it, it seems like everyone wants to take risk which yeah doesn't tend to happen um right before the market takes off to the upside it's kind of you know seems to happen you know if you look back in history let's go back and you know crazy like the tulip bubble right in uh in the 1600s in the netherlands that's you if you read the literature of the day it says people were sitting in shops they had nothing else to do and they were trading tulips, which by the way, also happened during a pandemic, which is kind of funny. Um, you know, so I would, I would kind of compare it to that. That's not to say that the entire market's just gonna collapse, but just the, uh, the sentiment of everyone sitting around and trading tells me everybody, you know, is willing to take risk, uh, which does not tend to happen at market lows. So, Absolutely. You know, it's a very, it's a very, it's a very general. Uh, you know, it's not really a timing thing, I guess, because the market can stay pretty crazy for a long time. But um, it's kind of a scary, a scary thought, right? Well, it, it sort of goes against the the notion that everything's in the price, and you're reading this chart of the price, um, but it's not taking into account something that people can largely do, which is to organize themselves online to, to take action on any particular stock. You know, GameStop was a, a great example of it earlier this year. Um, just so, something that we haven't seen before. Um, certainly active retail investors being able to uh, organize themselves like that. Yeah, let's let's see if we have anything on game on GameStop. This will be fun. All right, let's go to a weekly chart. Just for right. fun, let's see, let's see what would happen. Larry, I if see we, your message. We're, we're, we're going to come over to you just uh, quite shortly, I think. Um, and we can let Jamie continue with his day. Um, does anybody have any final question? We're going to have a quick look at GameStop. And look, see so look at this. <laughs> we know. Look where it went. In case anybody missed this earlier this year, this was a, a manipulation. Um, 
by retail investors on a stock. But pretty, pretty, pretty wild. wild. If you draw you draw a life of stock pitchfork, and that's where we went exactly. But would that be any sensible indication of what might happen, given that it was such an unusual event that caused that? Well, I guess, you know, it, there's always a quote unquote, you know, um, reason, I guess I'm just looking at it from the standpoint of kind of the, the natural flow of things, right? Um, it's not to say that this could have been, you know, traded unless you were trying to short it up here or something because, you know, you didn't have this. Tra the only way to trade this would have, and it wouldn't have worked in this instance anyway, but if you broke through this and then came back and then this was support, but we didn't quite get there. No. Right. No. Now you might've gotten there in an overnight session. I don't know. Um, but you know, that's the only, you know, setup to trade it. But like, it's not a coincidence that we've stopped right here. The market has decided, uh, you know, that this is as far as it can go based on this channel. So. I put um, sbtradedesk.com up there, Jamie. Um, as the yeah, I'll, I'll the send website. out um, if, we, if we if we if we send out some emails, um, we'll yeah. send out something. I don't have it set up right now, but would that be all right if we send out like a, you know an offer? I'd like to do that, I'd like because I've, I've been on the website. I love the website. It's a lot of good uh, content that you're putting out every single day. So it would be a good place for people to go and spend some time, uh, and if you can. Put together an offer for attendees sure. that would be really appreciated. yeah like if we if we look here you know like this would be like last night's setup right so you know we've got some of the things we looked at today so we got dollar you know it says uh you know where could we a pull back as possible from the center line which would be that's exactly where we went where we are you know um you know we have the trades here active trades pending trades you can see the aussie yen short trade right that was triggered that we looked at so this is kind of the format what it looks like and you know i'd love to send out love to send out an offer well let's do that when we're after this event if you can send me the details and we'll, we'll get it out to everybody that's here sure that'd be terrific Fantastic. Well, we've run over and we've run sort of uh, a little yeah. bit later than sorry. I'm so, sorry, sorry, sorry about that. No, I don't think it was you. It's just been a cumulative uh, event, every, everybody, and, and a few technical glitches uh, along the way, which has uh, resulted in things just being a bit delayed as, as it goes. It's like the traffic jam. Somebody dabs the brakes for a second and half a mile back, you've got a, a two hour delay. Um, but thank you for joining us, Jamie. And I'm sorry, I think we got you up too early uh, than you were supposed no, to no be. Worry. Uh, I'm going to I'm, I'm go. I'm going to go make uh, chocolate chip pancakes for my son. So. Oh, how 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 is your son? All well down there in Missouri? Are you back to normal? Oh, yeah. at the moment? It's been it's, it's been normal here for a while. Yeah, so we're good. Good. Um, very jealous. Well, listen. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, enjoy your breakfast, and uh, thank you for uh, giving us that overview of the markets. Will be uh, there's Wayne saying thank you. Just been on the website, so he's going to go through it in, in a bit more detail after that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks so a lot for having me. Let me take it back um, from you there. Let's see, I hit stop sharing. Is that all I need to do? Here we are. That's well. Yeah, I think that's it. Take the video. Okay. Take the video back. Great. Take care. Bye for now. All righty. Uh, bye bye. We are going on an adventure. Um, while Jamie was speaking there to me, um, I got a message saying that uh, we have overrun and uh, this room is going to close. Um, so what we've done is we've set up another room in the same event and it's up there. You'll see up the top left hand um, corner of your screen underneath the round the clock trader in the little yellow, orange, blue uh, logo it says schedule session two of three uh, main presentations that's where we are now if you click on the word um, more you will see a box uh, down there called Larry Pesavento now that's where we're, we're going to move into that room where we will not be cut off we're going to have uh, plenty of time there for Larry's presentation so going to get started in that in just uh, around about 60 seconds from now so we've got time for uh, a quick break if you need to
come pop the kettle on or anything like that. Uh, and then we'll be in that room uh, with Larry Pesavento in just uh, about one minute's time. Okay, I'll see you in there.